Hi, hello, good evening, my officers. Welcome to this exclusive marathon series on economics for UPC Prelims 2021. So, this is Nishan Ujjumuthi, your educator on Academy, an expert in Indian economy, current affairs, and MCQs. So, apart from that, I'm also one of an Academy's top plus educator, handling a lot of sessions with regard to economy, current affairs, MCQs. And even tomorrow, you have the new MCQ series launching in the An Academy Plus platform by me. So to know more about the details, you can just click on the description box of this particular video where you can find the link of my Unacademy profile. Okay. So yes, good evening, Sindhuja. Hi, Pratos. Yes, Shankar. <clears throat> Where are the others? So I think people are slowly joining. Good to see that. Yes. So here we go, my young officers, with this exclusive marathon series. So the speciality of this particular class is normally we do take class for 10 minutes, for 30 minutes, even for one hour in YouTube, right? So now, as far as this particular session is concerned, just like how a marathon goes on, this is exclusively a continuous two and a half hour, two, three hour session, wherein one particular topic which is pertaining to the UPSC prelims 2021 from the economy subject will be covered for you just like that. So anything and uh, everything under this particular topic will be covered in today's class. If you see money and monetary policy, banking, RBI, these are the most important highly searched topics by UPSC candidate. Indeed the most important and also the most searched one. At the same time if you see in this particular topic Every single year, I repeat, for the last five years question paper, if you take into consideration, every single year, you can see at least one question coming from this particular area. And it is damn, con I'm confident that this year also, at least one or two questions will come from the monetary policy, one from banking area exclusively and one from RBA current affairs policy exclusively. There is no doubt in that. So it's very, very important for you to have a quick understanding of the important hit list topics coming under this particular area in a short, quick and to the point manner. So this is not just a static class. I'll take you right from the NCRTs because in NCRTs you study about money, the different types of money, the origin, etc, etc. And then we go to monetary policy and RBI, the comprehensive part. So now a quick 360 degree coverage of the same will be done just like that for you people, followed by the interlinkaging of them with the trending hit list current affairs of this particular topic where you can get questions 101 percentage for the upcoming UPSC prelims 2021. Followed by the surprise is not over. People will think that marathon means just a theory. No, we'll be doing it all these things which require at least at least five to six hours guys in a matter of two hours followed by the next half an hour or one hour exclusively top 30 MCQs from this particular area. So what you study, you will be able to put them into practice and also test whether you really understood the concepts. Okay. So both theory plus the MCQs, the most exciting part is MCQs. I know that because our MCQs are a really UPC standard with the techniques, with the, uh, you know, tips. Followed by the KEC, the Keyword Elimination Comparison Technique, which, I've which I keep teaching you in the Unacademy free classes, the special classes, followed by the 360 degree coverage. It's a double the Makaka offer, I can tell you guys, two times, actor stretch revision. So no matter from your sleep, if somebody calls you also, you will be crystal clear in this particular topics, which I'm going to take for you today. 
So be ready and be very attentive and make sure that yes, you yourself is going to drill your brains today after this session. So all ready for this brainstorming sessions, my young officers. Yes, Soham, good evening. Yes, Sindhuja Pradosh and others. Yes, Devatarshini. Come on, you should have the josh. How is the josh? It should be pretty high. Wonderful. So here we go, my young officers. A quick look into the schedules of my classes for the month of August. You can just go through all those. Apart from that, in other YouTube classes of uh, channels of One Academy also, I do take classes. You can just go through them. And every day 9.30, you have the economy current affairs exclusively happening for 30 minutes. You can even watch them. From tomorrow, you will have it again because today we have the marathon till 10 p.m. So 9.30 cannot happen. So tomorrow it will happen. That is also hitless course. Apart from that, you can just go through, guys, taking into consideration the problems. We have the two-month subscription also available. See, one thing I'll tell you. Beat free class or plus class. The code NISHA IAS LIFE will give you double access to all those. For the plus class, you'll get 10% discount. But most importantly, you'll come under the personal mentoring program. That's indeed very important to be noted. So even the prices are reduced. So make sure that you are making the maximum out of it. Okay. So here we go. I know that people can't withstand that josh with regard to the uh, you know marathon series. And yes, to start from the scratch to the advanced level and then to go for the uh, you know UPC level questions. Here we go. So as far as this particular topic is concerned, it saves a lot of time for you with regard to making short and important notes of economy, current affairs and concept. And we are going to have an exam oriented discussion of the important hit list topics. Clear? So are you all ready to study economics through everyday stories from around the world? You should be. Yes, that's Josh. So here we go. Money, monetary policy, banking, RBI. So in this exclusive marathon series, we are just going to have a look into, a look into, uh, you know, what is money all about. You will be studying this in your economy, NCRT, class 10 and, uh, you know, 11. In those classes, those chapters, you'll be studying these, right? So let's quickly have a look at it. We all know that basically the only source of exchange today what we have for any transaction is money, right? But let's quickly have a look into the previous days, during the ancient days. Do you think you had something called as money? Definitely no. How did money evolve? So now money is something that evolved through the process of time. So now talking about the history of money, we can see something called as Bata system. What is butter? Not the other wala dosa or the idli ka butter that you make. This butter is called as exchange of good for good. I repeat, exchange of goods for goods. If you want to get one kg of rice and you want one kg of sugar in return, you have to search for the person who is willing to buy one kg of rice from you and who is having one kg of sugar to give you in return. Let's say for example, I may have one kg of rice with me. Now I have to find a person who needs that. Let's say for example, out of the class Sindhuja or Deva, I am giving one kg of rice. But Sindhuja may have one kg of sugar to give me. But Deva will have one kg of uh, you know tea powder to give me. But my need is sugar, so I'll go for sugar. So I have to keep finding the people. It's quite difficult. It doesn't make a sense at all. There is no proper standard of measurement. There is no deferred or future payments. There is no unit of account. It becomes totally hectic. But people used to follow that, which is called as Bata system. That is exchange of goods for goods. And even those days, it was so ridiculous that even small, small items were being exchanged for big, big items. Let's say, for example, one big cow has been exchanged just for, you know, two or three kgs of, uh, you know, wheat or rice. What is that? It doesn't make a sense at all. Don't you think so? Yes. So now that was over the time what happened, the so-called barter system was eliminated. Because there is no common medium or let's say unit of account, which is called as money in Bata, right? Because exclusively it talks about the exchange of good in goods. That's all I can tell you. Now, after this Bata system, what happened? Next was the evolution of the metallic coins. Gold, silver, copper, bronze. Oh my goodness, the age of coins or the metals happened. So now, if you see, overcoming the difficulties of Bata system, they removed Bata or the exchange of goods with the metal or, or gold coins, I can say. But that also has limitations. Though this so-called metals or let's say paper, uh, gold had some sort of value also, again, if you want to get something for a lesser amount, you couldn't have a proper unit there. Because these coins or metal coin, gold or metal coins, they are of standard or fixed value. You can't cut them as such. You got the point. So now, over the time, again, what happened? 
from barter or exchange of goods to goods to gold to metal coins and then paper money. That is your currency money. What do you have today? The pesa that you have in your hands. Don't you think so? Yes. So now it started becoming in that perspective. So now the paper money has come where it became more simplified for you and me to literally exchange, uh, you know, anything that we want. If you want to buy something now, there is a proper unit of account. There is a proper medium of exchange. There is a proper, uh, you know, deferred payment. I can say, what is deferred payment? Deferred payment means making payments in future. See, I can buy a product from you today and I can even pay you tomorrow. There is a future payment uh, option available because of the evolution of currency money or paper money. So all these things made money more, uh, you know, comfortable. The transactions exchange more comfortable. But do you think we stopped there? Definitely no. As the civilization progressed from the paper money to currency money, people preferred having plastic money. What is plastic money? Your ATM card, debit cards, all the kind of cards that you have in your pockets, they are called as plastic cards. Instead of keeping 10,000 or 20,000 in your purse or your pocket, people used to keep this small wala card in their pockets. Why? You can just swipe it and get the job done. That became more simplified. And today, without the use of currency and the use of these plastic cards, there is no need for you to even carry an ATM card with you. Just by having your mobile phones, the smartphones, fatafat, click, Take the Google Pay, take the Phone Pay, take the Paytm, take, take any other third party applications in your UPI, that is Unified Payment Interference and make the payment. Things became more simplified under the electronic or the digital or online money. Now, do you think it ended over there? Definitely no. From there again, the most advanced level, that is none other than cryptocurrency. Today, what you can see is the most, most advanced version with regard to the evolution of money called as cryptocurrency that actually evolved from something called as blockchain technology. It involves artificial intelligence and all the high level ultra technologies. And now cryptocurrency is what? It's also an online kind of currency only. You can't see them, now you can touch them, now you can feel them. But you can just see, that's it. It's not touch, you cannot touch or you cannot feel. But you can just kind of, yeah, see in, in the ledger format. That is when you store the digital currencies in the ledger format. Let's say for example, uh, you know, when you buy something, they'll redeem points for you, right? In the form of virtual coins, the same thing. And cryptocurrency, if you see, uh, the most common or the popular kind of cryptocurrency is Bitcoins. And if you see Facebook, the most famous social media platform, they also have a currency called as Libra. But Bitcoins is very popular since 2008-9, I can tell you. So now, from BATA system, you see to where we evolved, there has been a huge transformation with regard to the evolution of money. So starting from the basics, I took you to the advanced or the updated current affairs. So similarly, in this same notion, I'll be discussing every single topic for you. Clear? So there are a few topics where we'll do a quick revision of the theoretical or the static portion. And then towards the end, fatafat, fatafat, the current affairs of that. And that too, not pages and pages, but rather to the point. Where there is a requirement of 20 points, I'll teach you only 5 solid killer points. With that 5 solid killer points, you can derive the next 15 points by your own self. That is the method of this particular classes, guys. And these exclusive marathons by me is indeed another way in which you can make your things more simplified. Clear? So this is what you got to study with regard to the evolution of money. Is it very clear, all of you? Yes, Indija, uh, Divya and all others. <clears throat> Is it very clear? Okay. So now, here we go. As I told the same thing, what I've told you, I've just put it across in the PPT format. The commodity money, metallic money, paper money, you can just go through all those. Now, When you talk about paper money, you know, something is quite important as such. Don't you think so? Because this paper money, okay, they took the form of something called as banknotes. And that banknote was to be printed by whom? By the RBI, which is called as the central bank of our country. That is, I'll be teaching you regarding what is RBI. I'll teach you regarding the importance of that, all these things. Because they are supposed to be called as the so-called monetary policy, I can say. Right? 
So now from there only the bank deposits, the demand deposits, all these things evolved. That is, if you go to the bank today, you can deposit your money. Now, let's say for example, there is savings account, there is fixed account and all. If you are depositing 10 lakh rupees for a period of 5 years, that's called as fixed account, uh, right? Deposit in the fixed account. You can withdraw only at the uh, maturity of 10th year. But what if suddenly in the 5th year itself you want to withdraw? So you have to end up paying a fine or penalty. So that's called as demand deposit. At your demand, whatever deposit you want with the help of a check, you will be able to withdraw it. So there are so many advancements that have taken place. And today we are in the so-called cryptocurrency or Bitcoin era, I can tell you. The current affairs of all these things will be discussed with you once the theory is done. But I'm just giving a brief to you. What are you supposed to focus when you study about money? It is not just the Bata system or not just the metallic coins or the paper currency. Rather, the, the recent version. Because in your last year prelims examination, as per my prediction is concerned, you had a question from blockchain technology, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Remember, I told you cryptocurrency, bitcoins and technology is very, very important. And yes, you had a question, the similar question with the keyword, which we did in the Unacademy Plus platform and also in the 6 p.m. free classes of Unacademy. So now, this year also I'm telling you that some sort of topic, it couldn't be blockchain technology, but then it could be from Bitcoin, it could be from cryptocurrency. Because if you see, cryptocurrency is something uh, which is in the current affairs these days. It is an illegal way of uh, transactions, don't you think so? Due to which the government has said and due to which the RBI has said, Chalo, let's ban all the private cryptocurrencies and form a monitoring system for the cryptocurrency to make it legalized. So those are the associated current affairs with the cryptocurrency which you will be studying in the coming slides. Clear? Yes, Irfan, ma'am, cryptocurrency kya hota hai? Cryptocurrency is the most advanced form of currency, uh, if, uh, Irfan. It is a kind of what? What is cryptocurrency, by the way? You should be knowing it. Here we go. I'll explain to you. So basically, a cryptocurrency is a digital or online asset and they are designed to work as a medium of exchange, I can tell you, where you or me, if you have a cryptocurrency, now my, I will have an individual coin ownership records, which will be stored in a ledger existing in the form of, let's say, some sort some of computerized database. For that, I'll use some so-called, uh, you know, strong cryptography. So I'll be able to record the transactions like that and also secure them. So I can control the collaterums or let's say the corruptions of creating additional coins and verify the transfer of ownership, coin ownership, etc, etc. Very simple. When you take a subscription on Academy Plus platform, okay, they tell you that you get discount of 10% using my code Nisha IA is like, okay. But when you watch more and more classes in the Academy Plus, Plus platform, you earn coins. Have you seen that? Which is called as referral points. You can even redeem that. That is when you minus those coins, you will get a discount of extra 10% again. But you can't uh, get that, uh, you know, get that coin in the form of money or you can't even uh, see any value over there. But when you redeem, you're getting a discount of 10% from the amount you pay. That's called as cryptocurrency, something like that. It's a form of this ledger. It's a kind of digital asset or it's a kind of ledger which has been stored, I can say. The transaction when you store it with a lot of security and transactions. You can't use that money for anything else. You got the point. This is the whole meaning of cryptocurrency in the most simplified manner I can tell you. Clear? But you know, cryptocurrencies and all lot of collaterums and stuffs do exist here. That is also there. We can't say that it don't exist. Do, do exist actually. <laughs> now people will think that cryptocurrencies, why can't they be in the, uh, you know, existence of the physical form? But then they're not in any sort of physical form like your paper money. And uh, they're not been issued by any central authority. Because if you see the currencies of our country, India, it has been introduced by the authenticated authority. That is the central bank of our country, RBI, Reserve Bank of India. But in the context of cryptocurrency, that is not the case. There is no such legal authority coming up. That is why they don't have legal, uh, you know, tender. And now this cryptocurrency, because they are not issued by any central authority only, they are not centralized. Rather, they are decentralized, I can tell you. Because they basically use such kind of cryptocurrencies. They basically use what? decentralized control which is quite opposite to the centralized digital currency and also the central banking system if you see the paper currencies if you see the any other sort of uh, even your phone pay gg pay whatever digital currencies also it comes under the so-called uh, you know rbi there is a proper monitoring evaluation a centralized authority looking into it whereas in case of cryptocurrency nothing as such so they are decentralized where there are a lot of chances for the corruptions and all the other fraudries to take place. That is why the so-called legal tender that has not been completely given to cryptocurrencies because a lot of private people can come up and own it. 
a lot of uh, issues can take place that is why the government advised rbi to literally what literally ban all the private cryptocurrencies and that was catching the headlines i can tell you uh, in few months back with regard to the current affairs and all remember i have taught you this yes nayana welcome to the class it's been a long time is it very clear till for you people till your cryptocurrencies now talking more about cryptocurrencies remember guys it is one of the hit list topic for upsc prelims 2021 because last year also uh, questions pertaining to this particular area or the related area came so we can expect this year as well so now when you talk about cryptocurrency it's very important for you to have an understanding of what is one of the most popular or the famous cryptocurrency there are so many cryptocurrencies ethereum lithium uh, you know bitcoin and all but here bitcoin captures the attention because that is a hit list topic and now if you see this so called bitcoin okay they are considered to be the very first decentralized cryptocurrency and it is said that they were in discussion till 2008 and officially bitcoin first released as an open source software in the year 2009 and since which means for 11 years we are having this it's more than a decade you have bitcoins but only recently in the year 2020 21 i can tell you the so called bitcoins or the so called cryptocurrencies was in news because a lot of people came up with that but it was been existence before that also but the popularity just got shooted up these days clear and what happened guys when the bitcoin got re got released since 2009 since then if you see over 6000 alt coins what are alt coins alt means alternative theek hai the alternative variants of bitcoins or let's say other cryptocurrencies has been created because they found this to be quite useful they found this to be quite easy with regard to faking it out faking out things with regard to few other perspectives so now no central authority or uh, let's say no control is coming so it is easy for you to create how many cryptocurrencies you want one like a bitcoin you can have another bitcoin also because you are, uh, are not coming under any centralized control and all it is a digitalized uh, decentralized digital or online currency without a central bank like rbi or let's say any single administrator who is looking into it clear and the most important point to be noted here is that the bitcoin being an important form of cryptocurrency it can be sent from user to user that is you and me on a peer to peer bitcoin network i can say and there is no need for a third party application also to be there or a third person to be there even when you make payment via gpay or phone pay there is a third party third party application you are doing it from your bank account to somebody's bank account directly but there is a third party application where you end up paying a service charge which is very very minimal you will not notice it because the service charge is very very less but when you continuously do transactions that service charge these third party applications take it as a profit you understand in the context of cryptocurrency such kind of things do not exist practically especially in the context of bitcoins which is the most popular cryptocurrencies coming under blockchain technology so i can see prince gaudam asking a question what is blockchain technology see blockchain technology is very simple uh, prince actually because of that particular technology only you are having something called as a uh, cryptocurrency and also uh, under cryptocurrency the type of cryptocurrency is bitcoin so basically blockchain technology is nothing but it's a system of recording information you record all the information in such a way that it makes it difficult or impossible for you to change that information to hack that or even cheat the system these days we know that an activity like phishing an activity like cyber attack is quite popular so a technology called as blockchain is a technology where all your information is safe and secured nobody can do kallatrams to hack it or cheat you or whatever or grab the information out of your system in simple terms i am telling you so now don't you think so blockchain is very very essential such kind of security and uh, safety is required for the online or the digital ledger of transactions because that can be duplicated and distributed across the entire network of computer systems on the blockchain to avoid that you have this clear so it's a public digital ledger of transactions and what do they do a blockchain they record information in such a way it becomes very difficult for anybody to cheat or let's say to duplicate it or to alter it so it's a secure way for you and me as an individual to deal directly with each other without any corruptions and all and without any sort of intermediary it could be a government it could be bank or any other third party directly directly to person to person without a third party application you can have the contact and stuffs like that this is how practically a blockchain work clear and the only single reason why blockchain is uh, technology is preferable is because it is having an improved speed 
and highly and is highly efficient clear because all your data has been stored in a very unique way in an encrypted format and all right and it provides a highly efficient process i can say with trust transparency immutability etc etc is it very clear all your doubts with regard to blockchain as well because you should know what is blockchain technology and not cryptocurrency have you seen in whatsapp you have something called as encrypted that so called uh, scanning it's called as end to end data encrypted data it's a highly secured one you cannot hack uh, you know the whatsapp uh, just like that of another person it's not that easy as such yes rajneet and priya yeah something like that so an advanced version of that comes in cryptocurrency through the blockchain technology and out of that one of the important uh, you know cryptocurrency that is bitcoin clear yes friends ma'am what is e rupee which is recently joined we'll talk about all these things in the current affairs part of it god you can hold down this is a marathon class clear so don't worry we'll go step by step so yes here we go i hope it is crystal clear till here <clears throat> and here you have again the definition of blockchain transactions verified by network nodes through cryptography and recorded in a public distributed ledger is called as blockchains i know why are bitcoins created by the way why are they created see basically bitcoins was created guys which comes under cryptocurrency as a reward for the process known as mining now through this you can exchange these bitcoins for other currencies products and service ending up in making lot of profits again n number of kallathams do come there i can tell you that is a reality now here you have few important uh, slides which talks about <coughs> excuse me <coughs> this is indeed with regard to the uh, you know money and other perspective a quick look at it what is money we all know that one single word money is what money does that is it is the only uh, you know only single unit of exchange i can say that is the widely and the generally accepted uh, medium of exchange is nothing but money right because there are so many functions of money which has to be understood when you are able to accept something as a medium of exchange at the same time it also act as a measure and store of value and also you can even use for the future transactions you can make payments in future which is coming under the category called as deferred payments all these things can be done only by money that's the importance of money right there are so many functions you have primary function secondary function tertiary function i have compiled everything together you can use it as a medium of exchange you can store money it doesn't get spoiled because in those days if you see uh, the bata system what happened you were exchanging goods for goods these are perishable commodities they get uh, spoiled after some point of time but money years after years also it will be the same only the value will increase or decrease but then the money in the paper notes doesn't get spoiled like that you can measure them exactly for 100 gram for the 10 rupees you have 10 rupee valuation for 200 gram for the 50 rupees you have that valuation so you don't end up paying for 100 gram also 50 rupees for 200 also 50 rupees matlab there is a so called measure of value verification and also deferred surrender of payment you can make future payments as such you can buy a product today and make a payment tomorrow simple as that now all these are the basics guys in the notes what i'm giving you i'll give it to you so nothing to worry this particular note will be exclusively uploaded in an academy articulate telegram channel and also in my social media platforms as well nothing to worry so you can take it from there clear so these are quick revisions before your examinations these are kind of quick revisions which will enable you people to have a better understanding of all these concepts just like that fatafat fatafat like that now all these functions of money you can just go through here we go when you talk about money there are few things that that should come to your notice as such something called as modern monetary system now there are three important topics to be noted guys what is modern monetary system there is something called as convertible paper money or let's say full reserve system then in convertible money or fiat money and mrs what mrs not your mrp guys mrp is minimum retail price this is mrs minimum reserve system and these three modern monetary systems are quite important what is monetary monetary means something that deals with money right so the modern money or let's say the monetary system let's quickly have a look into what each of these are in detail now talking about uh, you know the convertible paper money or full reserve system what do you think it could be so you are converting the paper currency is that the case 
What is convertible paper currency? Anyone? You would have studied convertible paper money. It's a very important uh, topic actually. See, under this very simple guys, under this convertible paper money, from the term I can tell you that money is converted into standard coins which is made of gold and silver. And under this, the paper currency will be issued by the centralized authority. That is Central Bank of a country India, uh, which is called as RBI. And it will be fully backed by all these reserves of gold and silver which is of equal value. Just to have a backup I can say. Therefore, this so-called paper currency system which you are converting is called as full reserve system. In simple terms, you may have 100 CR of money printed, crore of money printed. Now, equal to 100 crore, the gold and silver will also be stocked up as a backup. So, that is called as convertible paper money or full reserve system. Clear? In simple terms, the money which can be converted into standard money on demand. Gold and silver, they are highly liquid. What is liquid, guys? Not the liquid wala thing that you take. Not your juice or water or tea or coffee. No. Here, liquid means, liquidity or liquid means in the context of money we are talking. It is easily liquid. It is easily transferable. Gold can be easily converted to cash. That is a highly liquid of all the assets, right? In that context, we are talking. Clear? But do you think currently, my question is as far as the current of us is concerned, do you have such kind of convertible paper currency? Yes, Ganesh, good evening. Yes, Induja, do you think do you have such kind of convertible paper currency? People are thinking. Priya is saying, yes, you do have. Two to three heads now. Really? See, the money that can be easily converted into standard money or demand is convertible paper currency. Right? It is called, and now, the current usage is nowadays convertible paper money is not in use. I repeat, convertible paper money is not in use because we have shifted to the online or ledger platform or the digital platform. So, things are quite different there. You understand? So, mostly we don't use that. Clear? The money what you create, it is not required that 100 crore of money you have. You need to have a 100 crore worth gold or silver to back up. No. Today, the backing up is automatically done by, uh, you know, by the money itself. They backed up by the reserves, I can say. Actually, convertible paper money, they are normally backed by gold or silver reserves. But these days, you know, it's kind of convenient that they are able to manage it also, I can say. What is inconvertible? The opposite. The money that you cannot convert so easily is called as inconvertible paper currency. And they are also called as what? The fiat money. Clear? And why do you think uh, it's called as fiat money or fiat currency, guys? See, a fiat currency is actually a national currency. Don't you think so? Ah, so now, yes Priya, now fiat currency is nothing but it's a national, you can write it down guys, these points, what I'm telling you, I will not repeat again. So now, a fiat currency is a national currency which is not pegged, I repeat, that is not pegged to what? That is not pegged to the price of a commodity like the gold or silver. You do not convert them like that, right? The value of money is largely based on what? It is not based on the value of gold and silver, rather the value of money is largely based upon the public's faith in the currency, we the citizens' faith that we have in the currency is issuer, that is Central Bank of our country, RBI, uh, or the government, I can say. It could normally be the country's government or the Central Bank, RBI. So that is called as inconvertible or fiat money in simple terms, clear? And this is the reason why they are called as fiat money or currency. Is fiat money good or bad, guys, by the way? Which one do you think? Do you think inconvertible currency or coffeeat money? Are they good or are they bad? What do you think? Come on, these are practical things which I have already taught you. It's just that you are revising with me in this marathon series. So, Gautam is saying it's good. Really? That more answers come up? People are still thinking. So, that's if you see for the question that is fiat money bad or good? Or let's say, it's, is it bad? For the question like that, I can tell you that this fiat money or let's say inconvertible money, okay. 
it gives the central bank or RBI a greater control over the economy because they can control how much money is being uh, printed. So don't you think so fiat money is good? Obviously. Let's say for example the most modern paper currencies like your US dollar, they are called as fiat currencies. So now you tell me, is fiat currency good or bad? And the most popular paper currencies like US dollar is also fiat currency. Obviously they should be the best because US dollar is considered to be the most important of all the currencies in the entire globe. Right? They are having a huge weightage. Even in the SDR which I taught in the last classes, special drawing rights which is an international reserve asset of the International Monetary Fund. They are also in the five basket of currencies. US dollar rank number one. Right? The weightage is too much. Though these are the advantages of fiat money also. See everything has a pro and a con side. I mean an advantage and a disadvantage side. So now what is the advantage? That is one of the important uh, you know advantages I told you they are kind of the most uh, you know preferable currency by the US economy itself because US dollar is based on that. But the disadvantage is that this fiat money ticket is that the government if the government is going to print too much of it then it will result in hyperinflation. Let's connect this fiat money in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. Why? Because we never had money. The economy is completely uh, in a shock. Don't you think so? So the government asked RBI to print currencies. We had no other go. How much will borrow? There is a limit for borrowing as such. Don't you think so? So now taking into consideration that particular scenario, what did they do? They kind of, uh, you know, made sure that this particular, uh, you know, printing of currency can take place. But when you keep printing currency, you, me, everybody is having what? Everybody is having sufficient amount of money in our hand. So our purchasing power or capacity increases. So when you have too much of money, automatically you spend to have to uh, spend too much on the commodities. So slowly what happens, the producers will start increasing the price of the commodities also. So no matter you have too much of money with you also, previously you, you, you used to get 1 kg of tomato for 20 rupees. You can even buy 1 kg of 50 rupees also. It didn't bother you much because you have a uh, you know huge money supply. But what if the same 1 kg of tomato becomes 200 rupees now? No matter you have too much of money in your hand or let's say the money supply is there in the economy also, you will be a little skeptical because too much money will start chasing too few goods. When it was 20 rupees and when it was, uh, you know, 50 rupees also you kind of managed. 1 kg, 2 kg, 3 kg, you bought like that. You didn't mind much. But when it is 200, you will even think whether you should buy 1 kg or half a kg. That becomes the case. And also, though you have money also, too much of money will start chasing too few goods. That is a scenario. That is the biggest disadvantage of fiat money. Because when inflation happens, hyperinflation, hyper is what? Just like how a person becomes hyperactive, you say, na? something like that. It will be from single digit or let's say mild or creeping inflation. It will jump to your uh, walking, jumping and then hyper or galloping inflation. Which is 3 or 4 digit I can tell you. The number of inflation will increase like anything. Which is very very hazardous or dangerous for the growth and development of our country India especially. Though inflation is a necessary characteristic also, there is a limit. That is, it goes by the famous saying. Amidha mailam amaradha vesham. Matla, too much of a good thing is also bad, hai na? Too much of sweet is also bad after some point of time for your health. The same thing. Clear? Yes, Priya, basket full of money and handful of goods. Exactly, that's inflation. That, that's something which is in the context of hyperinflation, I can tell you. You got the point. That will happen in the context of fiat money if it is not controlled. Now, having understood what is convertible paper money or inconvertible or let's say full reserve or fiat, the next is MRS. What could be MRS, guys? Again, the most simplified one. And one more thing guys, when somebody is asking a question, is fiat money uh, a legal tender? What will you say? See, it has no intrinsic value. A fiat money has no intrinsic value. While legal tender is any currency declared legal by the government. You got the point. So the government can issue fiat currency and they can make it legal tender. For that they have to set a standard. Uh, they have to set it as a standard for debt repayment. Because why I am telling you this is in one way I can tell you yes fiat money is a legal tender. Because the very big example is US economy. They use US dollar. The US dollar is both a fiat money and a legal tender. You got the point. The only example is that of US dollar where it is a legal tender at the same time fiat money. So we can't say that fiat money cannot be uh, uh, you know legal tender. They can be. Because the example of US is applicable there. Yes Priya it's an extreme condition I can tell you. Yeah very true. Sai yeah. Very true. 
moving on to the next important modern monetary system. These are concepts which you should know from the current affairs perspective. What is uh, minimum reserve system of RBI? It's very famous. Have you not heard 200 crores ka MRS? The most, uh, you know, hitless current affairs. I've taught you this. Here we go. See, minimum reserve. Reserve means what? The amount of money that you should have as a security or a reserve. So, minimum reserve is always associated with the uh, so-called figure that is 200 CR. You can just keep this as a keyword. Write MRS and write 200 CR. These are the keywords for you to memorize. So, now the minimum reserve system or MRS is nothing but it's the currency issue system which has been followed by none other than the central bank of our country that is RBI, Reserve Bank of India at present. We follow this MRS today guys. Okay. And doesn't mean that your MRS which has been adopted by the RBI is an old concept. Definitely no. So many years back, literally 30 to 40 years back you have it. Since 1956, more than 50 years I can tell you. Since 1956 you have this concept called as minimum reserve system by the RBI. And in this particular system, what is the RBI supposed to do guys? This being the currency issue system, I can tell you that in the minimum reserve system, okay, it requires the central bank of a country RBI to keep a minimum reserve or a minimum amount. What is the ratio or percentage or figure? It is 200 crore. That is the minimum reserve the RBI has to keep guys. And that should consist, that reserve worth 200 CR should consist of what? The foreign currencies gold coins and gold billion which is minimum of let's say at least 115 crore it should be more than 1 crore 100 crore sorry should be 115 crore at least in the form of gold the value of gold should be quite high that is for backing up this is called as MRS in most most simplified manner these many points are perfectly fine for you people to have a better understanding of what is MRS nothing else is required the year of launch, the importance, how it is connected and what are the important uh, currencies coming under that. Oh, sorry, the reserves coming under that. And out of that, which is given the highest weightage? It is gold. Because at least 115, 115 CR has to be maintained in gold. Simple as that. Clear? That is enough guys. These many points are enough. And by the way, this is a recent, recent current affairs car question. Take care. Okay, uh, I, I, I'm not going to ask you today's data. That will be too much if I gonna, if I ask you today's data. And one thing is that you will Google and see I know. But still, compared to this quarter, which starts from June, June, July, August, these three months, literally July last, Ju uh, no, June last, July, I can ask you, what is the minimum reserve of RBI? So I told you, minimum reserve system means 200 CR and all. That is there. But then, there is something called as minimum reserve Technically or let's say in the practical way, in figures, RBI should have. What do you think? I'm not asking in rupee terms. Don't tell me CR in rupee terms. I'm asking in dollar terms. Which one do you think? People are thinking. See, the dollar reserves or the forex reserve of RBI, the central bank of a country, currently as per uh, 25th June, 2001, 2021 data, it stands at dollar 608 billion. Now, what is the meaning of this? Dollar 608 billion, not million guys, billion. The minimum system is 200 crore we saw. But you see in dollar reserve capacity of RBI, it is dollar 608 billion, which means what does it show, reflect or what does it show? It is showing that a country, India, is the fifth largest reserve holding country in the entire globe. This is a very, very important point for the UPSC prelims. I repeat, we are the fifth largest country in the entire globe for what? For foreign reserve. Clear? Yes, Gautam, it's, a, it's a near about $700. Not approximately, it is $608 billion. As per the reason, 25th June 2021 card data. Kya Proud, right? We should be really proud. Yes, Naina, we should be very happy that uh, we are having so much of reserves here. And this COVID-19 pandemic has actually contributed. You can connect this topic with your FDI, foreign direct investments. Now apply the method of interlinkaging for you to have a better understanding. Okay. Remember an FDI, a country India could see better results in this pandemic time, especially with regard to the rise in FDI in our country. And over the past five years, we are doing great. And today, if you see in the third sector of the economy, out of primary sector, secondary sector and tertiary sector, 
the service sector or the tertiary sector, you can see the highest number of contributions from the foreign countries in the form of FDI, foreign direct investment. In that, the software, you have so many service sectors, you have education, you have health, you have uh, transport, communication, etc, etc. In that software and IT and information technology, they bagged the first positions for getting the highest number of FDI from other countries. This is the data as per May 2021, the recent current affairs, clear? And if you see the RBI's uh, foreign exchange reserve has been increasing sharply or tremendously, I can say, I can use the word sharply or tremendously. And that's what the new data is telling you. What is dollar six not eight billion showing you here? Come on, we have done great. That is why we have been able to become the top five countries in the entire globe for the Forex reserve as a whole. That is the foreign exchange reserve, right? So these many points are important. See, I taught you what is MRS. From MRS, you even got to know the current affairs of that. This is the way you should study, not the theory of MRS again and again. To the point, that's more important. Clear? Now, when you talk about minimum reserve, don't you think there should be something called as maximum reserve also? Obviously, there is. See, like your minimum reserve, the maximum or reserve is also fixed by the government. I can say here what the government will do is maximum means there is a limit. After that, you cannot go. Up to that, you can go. So under the maximum reserve system, the government will fix the maximum limit up to which the monetary authority, that is RBI, can issue the notes without the backing of any sort of metallic reserves like a gold, silver and all. And thus the monetary authority RBI, they will not be allowed or I can say, tell you that they cannot even issue the note beyond this limit prescribed by the government. That's called as maximum reserve system. So this is a major difference you got to understand with regard to MRS and, uh, you know, that is min RS and max RS, I can tell you. Minimum reserve system and maximum reserve system. These kind of things you would not have studied in a theoretical thing in UPSC because People accept that, uh, expect that you should know this from the current affairs. And in current affairs also, these terms will not come. But related to the values, minimum, maximum, that will come. But the concepts won't come. That is why I am kind of, uh, you know, explaining these for effort for you. So you have a very good understanding of these concepts to connect them with the trending current affairs. So your preparation becomes quite simplified. Don't you think so? Yes, indeed. That's why I'm here. Yes, Pratosh, yes, Priya. How is the limit decided? Priya, the limit is decided by the government on so-called parameters. And this doesn't stop here. There is something called as proportional reserve system. What is proportional? You have heard about proportional, progressive, regressive and degressive taxation, right? This is in the reserve system. See, proportional reserve system is actually, again, 1956, you had it. RBI is required to maintain a gold and, uh, you know, foreign exchange reserve of 200 crore. The same minimum reserve system now. The same thing is called as proportional reserve system. The same meaning. It's just that MRS, that is minimum reserve system, can also be called as proportional reserve system. That's it. A different name. Now, this is a very, very interesting, uh, you know, question to you. I taught you what is MRS, that is minimum reserve, maximum or proportional. Now, tell me out of the minimum and the maximum reserve system, which system is used by RBI to issue note? Very general question. It's a practical question that you should know. Tomorrow, who knows that you can't be RBI governors also? You can be. You should know all this, right? Tell me quickly, under which system? Yes, Arya, good evening. Come on, yeah. Come on, use your brains. What are you doing, all of you? RBI issues note or currencies under which system? Is it minimum RS or maximum reserve system? Amanda is saying minimum. Why, what if it is not maximum, Amanda? Think. People are thinking. Which one to say? Yes, Sindhuja. And that's a kudos to Amanda. Yes, it is under the minimum reserve system only. The central bank of a country, RBI, they are authorized to issue the notes up to any extent. I repeat, up to any extent. But though they can do that also, they have to keep a saturatory minimum reserve of gold and foreign security. And if you see a country in India, we have adopted this MRS in the year 1956. We all know that, right? 
and we had something called as proportional reserve system though it is similar to the MRS also there are a few disadvantages so I can say a proportional reserve system though it is called as a minimum reserve system also there are some uh, you know improvements with regard to the new concept of MRS or let's say minimum reserve system clear so these are the important points to be noted So you are done with the modern monetary systems. It's time for you to move on to the next important hit list topic. Indeed, the, the killer topic of the day with regard to monetary policy here. Money supply. So what is money supply? Yes, Sindhuja, we all told minimum. Chalo, you will get kudos and chocolates from me. Do not worry. This marathon will have so many gifts also, you know. The ones who give me right answers for the MCQ part of it will definitely get uh, chocolates. As I promised you in the Arn Academy free class. Virtually here, I mean, you know. Let me see. Let me see what the people are giving the answers. Then we'll think about chocolates. Hena? Like how we think in the uh, free special life class. So here we go. Back to money supply. So thus if you see. Money supply is what? Basically it is a total amount of money. Or let's say the currency. Don't you think so? Which has been present in economy at one particular point of time. The total money in circulation in the economy is called as money supply or supply of money. It could be in the form of currency or it could be in the form of deposit. That is when you go to a bank and deposit... What is the bank doing? The bank is giving you an uh, uh, interest for the deposit you made. If it is a fixed deposit and now that money has been circulated among the public. The state bank or the Kendra bank which is a commercial bank. The money what you deposit will be circulated by the bank to others and they will charge the interest from them. So the bank is running the business. So the money is not kept constant. It has been circulated and people utilize that for starting a business, for doing an investment. So we are able to actively involve that money in the process of economic activity or production process so that rolling is happening right that makes a lot of sense i can tell you so now there are few standard measures if you want to define money and that usually include the currency in circulation and the demand deposit that is at your demand you can withdraw the money that is the whole notion with demand deposit so dd is actually a very important hitless topic in the context of non-banking financial company which i'll be discussing with you in the coming slides take care yes we need so here we go. Who is having a record of the total supply of money in our country? Obviously, the Reserve Bank of India because they are the monetary authority, right? Now, what happened? There is a change in supply of money. When the money supply or the level of supply of money in the economy, if it is changing, if it is increasing or decreasing, automatically it can have an impact or an effect in the price level of securities. If there is too much of money, means automatically price rise will happen, inflation will take place. If there is too less of money, then deflation will take place. And sometimes because of this change in the supply of money, increase and decreasing of money supply, automatically the rate of exchange, the business policies, the government decisions, all these things get altered or changed. So it is having a huge implication, I can tell you. Clear? So in simple terms, the money that has been circulating in the economy is called as money supply. And this money supply is basically concerned with something called as circulating money. And that talks only about the highly liquid forms of money, like your currency and bank deposits, which is usually considered. The things that you can easily convert into cash, that is what normally you uh, talk under the notion of money supply. Clear? Now, when you talk about money supply, it's very, very important for you to have an understanding with regard to the measures of money supply. You know why? Because based on these measures of money supply or the M1, M2, M3, M4 only, questions can come for the exam. That is the hitless topic of this particular area. Clear? So, but if you want to have a better understanding of those measures, you should know what is the definition of money supply and the other perspective. Take care. So, here we go. The next heading, that is the measures of money supply. How do you measure them? They basically expressed using different monetary or money aggregates of total. M1, M2, M3, M4 and all. So, you even categorize them as narrow money, broad money and all. Because that is how you used to denote money supply. So now talking about the uh, you know money supply in common man's term, the total stock of money that you have in the economy. Right? That is the currency what you have in your hand plus the deposits that you make in the commercial bank. That's called as money supply. Right? Talking about the uh, you know measures of money. As I told you M1, M2, M3. But before that there is something called as MO or M0 I can say. But you can call it as MO. That makes a sense. Now it is called as reserve money. Under the measures of money, the very first one is called as reserve money or MO. 
and this is called as the monetary base or let's say monetary uh, I mean base money or high powered money because this reserve money is the base level for the money supply from the reserve only you can think of circulating or supplying the money you should have something with you right that is why the reserve money is also called as what the high powered component of the money supply in a very very simple terms i can tell you that reserve money is the currency that is in circulation along with what plus the deposits of commercial banks with rbi now look at this carefully deposits of commercial bank with rbi what is meaning of that now are the commercial bank is supposed to keep few amount of their deposits as a reserve in the form of crr cash reserve ratio and slr such a liquidity ratio guys that is what your reserve money is all about that is whatever currency is in circulation plus whatever deposit the commercial banks are keeping it directly with the central bank or rbi that is what the reserve money or mo consists of that's why they are called as high powered body or base money because that is a base na commercial bank is keeping a reserve with rbi so automatically there should be a base as such you got the point so here we go currency in circulation plus bankers deposit with rbi plus other deposit with rbi you can just go through all this now what is m1 now from here it is more important those are reserves the m0 and is a reserve thing your m1 talks about narrow money it consists of whatever currency you and me as a public or individual is having plus whatever deposits you are making in the bank so currency with the public plus deposit money of the public which consists of demand deposits with banking and also other deposits with rbi so it is narrowed so that's called as what it's called as m1 i can say clear now what is m2 a little advanced version m2 consists of m1 currency with the public demand deposit banks and other deposit with rbi plus something new called as savings deposits that too with the pos post office savings bank so that's an addition but this post office savings now many a times it can fluctuate it's not that stable so due to which uh, you know you can't call m2 as a broad money yeah but it is having something extra compared to m1 now the next measure of money supply <clears throat> is m3 which was very popular among you people because we come across m3 every now and then so the next measure is m3 and that is called as broad money but that doesn't mean that m4 is not important m4 is even bigger than m3 but we don't call it as a broad money i'll tell you the reason for that hold on before that what is m3 m3 consists of m1 that is m1 is what m1 or money supply one measure of money supply one is the currency in circulation in the economy plus the deposits uh, demand deposits in the bank plus other deposit the rbi including something called as time deposits here fixed account comes guys this time deposit banking this time deposit is very very important it has a lot of sense that is why the m3 is always called as the aggregate money or the broad money clear what is m4 m4 is bigger than m3 but there is a problem in m4 i'll tell you though m4 is consisting of m3 also post office saving is coming and that doesn't take into consideration or i can tell you they exclude nsc that is national saving certificate whenever this post office saving comes now there is no stability or uh, you know i can tell you reliability that is why you never consider them as a broad money so though m4 is bigger people will think that ma'am m4 is bigger than m3 then how can we say m3 is the uh, you know broadest form of money because it consists of time deposit whereas m1 m2 m4 none of these measures of money supply has time deposit so who is having the priority obviously m3 that is why m3 is considered to be the broadest form of money supply clear also called as aggregate money or total money so this particular doubt is cleared i hope among all you people that could be the normal notion or let's say the doubt everybody can have but it should be fine for you to clear it now <clears throat> now there is another concept in economics called as money multiply you know why you study this because in the current affairs perspective all these things will come when you talk about the tools or instruments of rbi which is very very important obviously this concepts like multiplier like that this sub kuch will come there clear yes priya now here we go money multiplier is not denoted by the small m guys in economics so basically it is an approach a multiplier is what 1 2 3 you are incre increasing so basically money multiply is nothing but an approach which is used to demonstrate the maximum amount of broad money that is m3 i can tell you and that could be created by the commercial banks your state bank your canara bank or any other bank for a given fixed amount of base money or let's say reserve ratio 
that is the mo base money is what the reserve money right that's what they're telling you so money multiply is known as m in economics and that is the inverse of the reserve requirement r that is m is equal to 1 by r clear so whatever broad money or m3 you have deposits with that is your m1 plus the time deposit an approach you are using to describe the so called maximum amount of uh, m3 or broad money which can be created by the commercial banks uh, for the given amount of base or reserve money it's called as money multiplier in simple term because that is doubling the money that you are going to get that is the whole logic here now Talking about M1, M2, M3 and all, I taught you what is M0 or 0 before. It's called a reserve money, the monetary base. Right. And as mentioned earlier for you people, yeah, it denotes what the money of RBA. It's a reserve of RBA, the commercial bank have to keep. So, this MO will include the currency in circulation along with the reserve of the bank. Even though money su supply can be denoted either as M1 or M3, usually when you speak of money supply, we think only about M3. That is because they are the broadest money. For the sole fa reason that time deposits do come there. That is fixed account deposit or time deposits do come there. That is the only single reason why when you talk about money supply, the next measure of money supply that comes to your brain is nothing but M3, which is considered to be the broadest form of money. Clear? Here it goes. The alternative measures of money supply published by the central bank of a country are by M1, M2, M3, M4. The same thing, whatever I've taught you, in formulas I've given you. CU is currency in circulation, DD is demand deposits. Don't get confused, CU plus DD. Don't think it is uh, cafe coffee day I've mentioned here, okay, CCD. <laughs> it is CU is currency in circulation and DD is demand deposits. Anyways, back to class. Now, having understood the importance of money and uh, measures of money and the concept of multiplier and all, don't you think it's high time for us to pitch up with monetary policy? Come on, this is indeed, indeed the most important topic of the day, I should tell you. Right? Because we are waiting for this comprehensive part to pop up because a load of questions do come from that. So let's quickly have a revision of this amazing topic, guys. And here we go. Monetary policy. What is monetary policy, basically? The policy adopted by the Central Bank of a country, that is RBI, Reserve Bank of India, which is called as Monetary Authority. And they will control either the interest rate payable on very short term borrowing or the money supply. That's what basically they do. So monetary policy is equal to what? The policy of Central Bank or RBI, that is the Bank of India in very, very short and sweet and simple term. Now, this particular monetary policy, yes, and above this particular monetary policy, what do they do? They often target inflation. That is when there is a price rise in the economy or a slowdown of price. Automatically, monetary policy is put forward by RBI to control all those. Because they want to ensure something called as price stability. There shouldn't be too much fluctuations of price in the economy. There should be some sort of stability. And generate what? A kind of trust or confidence in the currency, I can tell you. And as far as the country India is concerned, who carries out this monetary policy? Of course, it comes under the authority of the central bank of a country. It is RBI. Clear? What is the main objective? There are so many objectives. Growth, stability, that, this, etc, etc. But in one single term, I can tell you that the most important and the uh, you know unavoidable objective of the monetary policy of our country in the context of RBI is growth with stability. I repeat, growth. Growth with price stability is the only single object of RBI. Clear? I mean monetary policy. And we know that in a country, India, the central bank of a country, RBI, it play, play a very important role in controlling inflation or price rise. For that, they have to consult a lot of uh, tools, instruments put forward by RBI. There is a process called as inflation targeting. A lot of stuff like that. So, I'll tell you what is inflation targeting. Hold on for a while. So, before that, in the current affairs perspective of monetary policy committee, when I teach you towards the end of the class, I'll teach you what is inflation targeting. Take care. That is your targeting or fixing inflation to control the money supply in the economy. Simple as that. So, more about it, I'll tell you. And now, what is the current inflation targeting framework? Is it tight or rigid or flexible. Of course, it is very much dynamic or flexible for our country, India, I can say. The inflation targeting framework is kind of flexible. We change according to the situation and circumstances of the rate because it's quite difficult for us to follow one single notion being a developing economy. At the same time, this COVID-19 pandemic has set back a huge financial pressure for the economy to a greater extent. Clear? So you can just have a look at it. What, what about the monetary policy in your country, India? Don't you think so? In India, monetary policy is very important. Indeed, very important. 
because without monetary policy you cannot even think of what you cannot even think of managing things in a proper way that's a very uh, you know realistic fact right it's indeed a true fact also i can tell you because the rbi being the central bank of our country is the monetary authority of india because they are the one who control the money supply uh, and also the bank credit no doubt in that if you want the banking system to meet all the legal or the legitimate money or credit requirements you need this monetary policy because people can take money from loan or from the bank as loan and use for some unproductive activities also of suffer some speculative reasons so you cannot encourage the people to keep taking that and doing all the uh, you know bad wala activities right we got to be careful and uh, you know kind of using our brains what to use and what not to use so monetary policy is quite important in all these perspective so there are so many objectives guys of monetary policy i have already given the explanation in the slide you can read them up but as of now the one single uh, policy or i can tell you the backbone of the monetary policy in india is nothing but growth with stability growth is there but no stability that there is no point fayda nahi hai ekdam bekar hai growth hai na there is no point at all so why would you even think about growth or why would you even think about the stability so both together achieving both together is something which makes a sense with regard to the objective of what monetary policy so keeping this so called uh, you know concept or notion in mind the few important objectives of monetary policy here we go growth with stability we all know that right if you have a growth obviously you got to have a stability because traditionally i can tell you that monetary policy we focused when initially it was put forward they just wanted to control inflation just for controlling the price rise of inflation we used to have monetary policy and what did they do they used to do that through contraction means reducing the money supply and credit have you seen a rubber band guys if you stretch they expand if you leave they contract similarly as far as the monetary policy objective is concerned okay they wanted to control inflation initially and they were doing that just by contracting or reducing the money supply and credit but what happens when you keep reducing the money supply yes kriti good evening you are late i was looking where were you yes sindhuja vijay malleya the fugitive economic offender yeah you can connect that with uh, uh, nbfc non bank national companies it's so not nbfc sorry uh, nps non performing assets or bad loans that will be highly relevant there as well but very good point you made the kallathram ka raja and i know that i mean all the kallathrams what has happened anyways back to class so as i was telling you uh, regarding the uh, you know objectives of monetary policy so now when you keep uh, controlling inflation or money sub, i mean price rise by reducing or contracting money supply no activities cannot take place when the economic activities cannot take place like investment production distribution automatically what will be the end result the end result will be poor growth no development that's indeed pathetic don't you think so and that is why rbi said that see it's not just about the growth it is something called as growth with stability that is in times of inflation also rbi cannot contract or reduce money supply like that they have to provide sufficient credit or money for increasing the needs of different sectors of economy at the same time they can control inflation within a certain limit now only the factor called as inflation targeting comes into role that is they will target inflation that is if you see in the year 2016 what happened was like a committee was formed by a person called as urjit patel he was the rbi gov- rbi governor previously ex rbi governor but in the year 2014 to 16 he was not the rbi governor he was the deputy rbi governor theek hai so under him a committee was put forward and he was chairing the committee that is why this committee came to be called as urjit patel's committee and they gave a name for this committee called as npc basically for the monetary policy uh, you know a framework only this monetary policy committee was put forward every time if you see now the policy taken by the rbi with regard to spending or, or let's say expenditure activity of one particular project or with regard to uh, reducing taxation or spending activity or expenditure of government uh, you know it clashes government will say we'll increase it rbi will say no no we'll decrease it so there are a lot of confusions and conflicts and cold war fit fa- uh, fatafat jagda hai barabar jagda do happens you know that always happens so many times when one policy is taken by rbi uh the government of india will say no no let's not do that because rbi is different from government of india though rbi functions under the purview of government of india government of india exclusively for all these matters the department of economic affairs ministry of finance the Go- ministry of finance government of india is the ministry handling all these policies uh, in par with the rbi rbi is also having discretionary autonomous power but then there are some sort of differences right and that is what they say and thus if you see i can tell you that uh you know as far as as far as the uh you know monetary policy committee is concerned there was so much of jagadas and fight at the end of the day what happened 
they said we have to arrive at a conclusion we cannot keep encouraging this that is how under usur patel's chairmanship the monetary policy committee was put forward in the year 2016 2016 in that they said that year after inflation that is uh, the price rise the methods of calculating that will be changing from the wholesale price index to the consumer price index you can refer to the fundamentals of economic class which i was taking in the same youtube channel guys crystal clearly have explained regarding uh, wholesale price index consumer price index production price index gdp deflator and all you can get back to those classes clear they are all free classes and now yes jay verma now as far as mpc is concerned it was put forward basically to make sure that such kind of difference doesn't exist so what they do is that a committee of six members it was formed so three members are from rbi including the abe governor and remaining three members are from government of india and abe governor is having an upper hand he doesn't have a veto power but he has an upper hand in case for example a decision is to be taken 3 3 each both the decisions are having the same voting means now rbi governor can take a decision exercising the power that he has because it's in a neutral stage you got the point such kind of things are uh, permissible in that only they said we have to target inflation we cannot let inflation to be too less and too high also there should be a range or a limit for it so they targeted inflation called as inflation targeting at what rate at the rate of 4% with a plus or minus band of 2% which means 2 4 6 8 6% you can increase inflation and up to 2% you can decrease you cannot increase inflation above 6 and you cannot decrease inflation below 2 so the ideal is 4 percentage that's what is called as 4 percent with a plus or minus band of 2 percent you got the point so this is how they targeted the inflation yes and the like a tie it was some more or less like something like that so now don't you think such kind of targeting important but in reality what happened but in this covid 19 pandemic what happened my young officers last year in the month of august september and all you could see inflation level shooting up above the maximum limit of 6% you can see 6.7 7.2 even 7.8% rate of inflation which is very very high and rbi was just keeping quiet and you know they did something also they kept the interest rate or the bank rate constant under the context of accommodative stance they followed a policy of accommodative stance all these things have taught you we'll be discussing these once again do not worry i'm just brushing up for you the current affairs what you studied okay to make your uh, preparation more simplified so now all these things was happening because they said this pandemic is hitting the economy so badly not only the economy rather the entire global economy and we are connected we are uh, connected to the entire world via trade supply chains and all even the global supply chain got affected so what do you do you just have to sit chup chap just like that so this will be they said it will be rectified over the course of time but the economy was totally in a shock and the people were suffering because of this excess excess price rise it is over and above the uh, targeted rate of inflation of 4% with plus or minus band of 2% right that is up to 6 and more than 6 it was slowly things got rectified but this also happened in a country very recently i'm telling because the situation was such that the pandemic has taken over the entire financial uh, you know position of our country and we have the financial pressure has driven us like anything clear yes priya now it's better yeah of course it is far far better priya it is thousand times better i can tell you yes kri the price of commodities everything has come down that time it was not like that everything was costly yes in the day it's like a revision for me as you to call this in plus yeah yeah it's absolute revision do not worry in plus class another interesting classes will start in plus so you do not have to worry about that at all the mcq rain will happen in the plus so why to worry having understood growth with stability objective and also you know inflation targeting this is in the context of current affairs where you can see monetary policy committee or mpc also coming up i hope it is clear and now as i told you three members from rbi three members from government of india that is how the mpc is put forward and now one more point to be noted is that basically this mpc okay it people think it is for uh, the the minimum 10 year is 2 years 3 years 5 years and all 
it is not 2 it is not 3 it is not 5 that's the most comical thing it is 4 years from nowhere out of the blue moon it is kept as 4 years normally we think it is 3 years or 5 years that's the normal notion they give 2 3 5 but in case of monetary policy committee they said the fixed tenure is 4 years and in a year at least 2 times they meet 2 to 3 times but in this pandemic situation 6 to 7 times they met the committee was formed every now and then to take proper actions because that was a demand or need I can tell you clear so this 4 years wala point make a note of it because people tend to get confused when that is given in the MCQ part that is why I am telling you that clear Then, regulation, supervision, development of financial stability. That is also another objective. You have to. Because internal and external shock. Within the country and after the country, some shocks happen. Not the other wala shock, electric shock. I talk about the money supply and the other trade perspective or the other, uh, you know, circulations. That can literally threaten the financial stability of the country. So, we got to have a proper regulation, supervision of that to ensure financial stability. Clear? Then, promoting priority sectors. Indeed, one of the most important objectives of monetary policy. Because, you know, Agriculture is indeed the most important priority sector to be considered. Not only farming or uh, farming activity, even the allied activities. Along with that, the export. Every perspective. Agriculture export, industrial export, whatever export. Because export will fetch better revenue in the context of forex or foreign exchange. Then, improving the uh, or, or helping the small scale enterprises and the vulnerable or the weaker sections of the population. All these are priority sectors. Start promoting them. Make sure that adequate amount of money or supply or credit or loan has been given to these sections. We can connect this topic with the PSL. What is PSL? Priority sector lending. That is a, indeed a new policy taken by the RBI under the purview of Government of India to ensure that these sectors which are ignored are been given the highest priority. Clear? So as to ensure that, I repeat, so as to ensure that these sectors are not missed out and the economy is not going down or let's say the economy is not devastated. Clear? Though you have RRB, what is RRB? Regional Rural Bank. What is Cooperative Banks? Small scale unit banks, right? So, though you have regional rural uh, banks also, basically you take care of the rural requirements and credit, still, still somewhere or the other, we are not able to match up to the expectations or, or let's say the uh, objective that we want. That is why priority sector lending scheme was put forward to make sure that be it the RRB, be it the, uh, you know, Cooperative Banks, be it the number, be it all these banks, they are giving 75% of their loans to these priority sectors and only then they are shifting it, including education guys being a priority sector. Only then the remaining 25% they give it to other sectors. Because we got to develop the entire rural area. Development of rural India is indeed important. That is why you even have a ministry called as Ministry of Rural uh, you know, Growth and Development, right? So you can connect all these points with this regard in this regard as well. Clear? Now, the next important objective of monetary policy and how we can associate them with the current affairs is employment generation. You can connect this to the uh, you know unemployment issues we have and the fluctuations in your GDP. That is, GDP is increasing like anything. One, two, three, we are the top fifth or sixth country in the world. Okay, very fine in terms of GDP or statistics. But a country with the highest number of unemployment, I can tell you. So, social evil is backing up, is kind of uh, nagging up as like anything. And poverty levels, oh my goodness, that has strive has, uh, that has driven uh, or let's say that has striked us more harder, I can say. So, the more and more investment, that is the monetary policy of the country can influence the rate of investment in the allocation with regard to different economic activities and all. So, automatically, it will lead to employment generation because more employment opportunities, automatically people will get a better income. With that, their living standard will improve. Automatically contributing to what? The growth and development or let's say in GDP in terms of figures or numbers. And the next is external stability. We all know that. External stability is very important because currently as far as the current affairs is concerned, import and export. It is increasing these days. But we prefer exports to be of a greater value because when you export more and more from your country, you are producing that product in your country, satisfying the domestic demand and then the surplus you are exporting. So you are earning in terms of forex or foreign exchange. Right? Now, today if you see, we are able to increase more of export, we are even importing, we, are, we have reduced the import of unwanted product, but still we have to import some essential items. There is no option for us, like crude oil, petrol and all, right? So, if you see all these things, the linkage of our country, India, with the increasing import and export, with the global economy, it is getting stronger. So, previously, RBI used to determine the exchange rate and they used to control the foreign exchange market. Currently, they do not do. Because of this growing uh, linkage of our country, India, with the global economy, they have an indirect control of external stability. Because instead of the fixed exchange uh, perspective, they have moved to a flexible one. 
they are kind of dynamic based on circumstances and situations they can kind of easily fluctuate clear to maintain the external stability then increasing saving investments all these things are also the objectives of monetary policy redistribution of income and wealth to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor now regulation of nbfis non banking financial institutions like your idbi uti ifci etc they play a very important role in the economy don't you think so see monetary policy doesn't mean only rbi and commercial banks like state bank or canara bank or indian bank no even your uh, nbfi is also important like uh, in, uh, you know the uh, unit trust of india uh, 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 you know international financial cooperation all these things are important because they help in deployment of credit or money and also mobilization of saving though rbi is not directly controlling all these non bank financial intermediaries also through how through monetary policy they can indirectly influence the policies because it has to come under the purview of rbi they cannot run away like that so what now the other way the control of the i of rbi is also on such kind of non bank financial institutions so they don't do much of kilatrams of fraudries and they don't just kind of you know leave it like that clear now what does this picture indicate moving on to the next topic of discussion what does this picture indicate quickly tell me what does it indicate people are thinking what are you telling ma'am someone is increasing one is decreasing so what could be that yes pata nahi kya hai boy people are still thinking naina is saying growth and unemployment 2 to 3 on your head priya is saying fluctuation kriti is saying exponential growth exponential oh, you are you are right with e i won't say exponential but e is correct there you got somewhere or the other you are near to the point sindhuja is saying inflation yeah it is something related to that but not inflation see inflation is going up deflation is coming down fine but we are talking about monetary policy so what could that be it is nothing but <clears throat> inflation and also the expansionary and the contractionary monetary policy which we will be studying so that's a kudos yes in the ja and amanda wonderful so what is inflation now that again comes under monetary policy right in simple terms when there is a continuous or a persistent growth in the general price level in simple terms when the price increases today if you see the price of petrol it was 100 rupees then 103 107 and now it has become again to 99 but still it is increasing only increasing decreasing but not decreasing to greater extent the price of fuel has increased that is inflation right so now for example we say that when the, when the price of goods and services increase over the time it's called as inflation but inflation is a necessary characteristics for our country india guys because we are a developing economy without inflation we can't develop but there is a limit that is why i taught you what is called as inflation targeting theek hai i taught you what is inflation targeting because of that you got to have a limit doesn't mean that just like that you keep uh, you know increasing the numbers like that there should be a limit as such now what happens when the value of money falls in the entire world or global economy because of rise in price of gold there is something to be considered or noted that is the value of money in the entire world is decreasing but that is leading to a rise in the price of gold gold is having a higher demand or value across right because there is a reserve asset as such automatically that situation is called as inflation in a practical way so i have given you a practical example also for a better understanding now when there is too much of price rise as i told you before too much of price will start chasing too few goods automatically you and me though we have a better purchasing capacity also we can't buy anything because as a common man or person we have to spend more money to acquire few items which doesn't makes a sense at all right now talking about the different types of monetary policy this is very very important expansionary monetary policy and contractionary monetary policy think about a rubber band a normal rubber band guys you expand it stretches it expands you leave it they contract something like that this is expansionary and contractionary if you understand what is expansionary it will be easy for you to understand what is contractionary because they are highly connected now expansionary monetary policy is what it has been adopted only when the price rise or inflation is curved or decreased 
and the main objective of RBI central bank uh, becomes to reduce the unemployment rate because they want to avoid recession if at all it happens what is recession slowing down of economic activities I repeat slowing down of economic activities your employment your money supply investment everything comes down if you do not take care of recession then it is a dangerous situation that is this is called as business cycle people will think it is a snake that I have drawn has a name not me who cycle a business cycle okay <laughs> so the topmost portion talks about boom period the lower portion talks about uh, you know depression the the extreme opposite conditions and the middle portion talks about recession so boom is a period where your output employment everything is brilliantly great but that's an extreme condition that's not good for a long time depression is the opposite just like a person get depressed you won't you'll not be active your entire value skills everything comes down right when you normally get a, uh, when you normally be depressed is also for no reason your body activity not doesn't function properly so think about depression for an economy everything comes down the economy will come to a standstill you can connect this to the 1920s and 30s great depression put forward by an economist called as uh, you know john maynard keynes jm keynes this is a theoretical thing anyways now between boom period and depression period there is a period called as recession it's a warning signal i can tell you now from the boom period when the economy is uh, coming in a very very bad stage recession is an indicative factor it's reflecting chalo it's it's indicative thing a red light kind of indicating now you have to be very careful if you do not take proper actions will be in trouble the covid 19 pandemic more or less in the 2019 after uh, you know april june the economy is entering into recession because this pandemic broke out just like that we never knew what to do uh, or uh, what are the precautions we taken everything everything came to a standstill so economy is slowly in the process of recession slowing down of economic activities but suddenly what did the government do they came up with the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan the 20 lakh crore economic stimulus package or let's say the self reliant india mission <clears throat> the self reliant india mission i can tell you where you will be self reliant in what you do you understand so now here they put five different measures under five different tranches big big measures uh, with regard to the first one was the availability of credit or money supply to the msme micro small medium enterprise because majority of people are put up in that sector the informal sector and the startups and all due to unemployment issue so they need money to start up and come back then with regard to the migrant people with regard to the banking sector so many stuffs like that right so because the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan measures was taken yeah i can tell you that whatever let it be a success or a failure a complete success or a partial success to an extent you were able to pull your economy or let's say you were able to uh, make sure that the economy has not completely gone into depression that is indeed an important point to be noted don't you think so yes it is it's indeed very important so this is called as recession so avoiding recession is very very important if you do not avoid recession now things will become the worst i can say because recession is giving way to what to inflation yes kriti these inflation recession questions directly asked i think on last comp i got the same question yes kriti remember in the plus class also i've taught you this in the free 6 pm class also in the uh, marathon sorry in the carnival classes in unacademy platform all these we have done the same thing we are revising it so these are important topics that's why i said see i will not take the entire things for you as always 360 degree coverage to the point discussion because this will only really stay in your brains even in the night time if you wake you up and ask regarding uh, any topics of this area you will be like oh my goodness chalo without even opening the book it will be registered into your brains like anything that is the benefit of these kind of sessions see marathon means the session which is supposed to take for at least 9 hours or 10 hours theory plus uh, current affairs and all No, ten class is also small guys, but I'm just keeping at ten. We are doing in just two or two and a half to three hours means concept plus current affairs and everything under this topic, with starting from the NCERT basics to the advanced level. That's what I told you. It's not an easy task. That requires method of interlinking and connection. The three C method of approach which I have taught you in the plus class. Remember, conceptual method then. understanding the concept plus interconnecting them with the comprehensive syllabus of the uh, syllabus of economy plus interlinking them with the trending current of the 3c method keep this in mind this will uh, you know benefit you like anything yes priya we will start like radio 
Amanda is saying it's revision. Yes, obviously. <laughs> yeah, you will become like that. See, practice means makes a man perfect. You may take one hour or two hours to study these things by heart, some concepts. But if you practice continuously like that, within two to three sec minutes, not seconds, minutes, around four to five topics will go through your brains just like that. That's the benefit of doing things repeatedly. So the more and more you become skillful or expertized, the less time you take to study or to revise them. That's the biggest advantage. Clear? Sindhaja is saying we'll sleep then. 10 hours and all I won't take uh, Sindhaja. I'm also a human being <laughs> because I will not uh, kind of do all those things. Such kind of stupid things of 10 hours and all I won't do continuously. Like 3 hours a day, 3 hours a day makes a sense. Or a gap of at least 15 minutes, 1 minute the MCQs. But I have done 10 hours also. Remember last year prelims examination we had marathons. From morning 9 to night 11 or 12 we did. One, just one hour, one thing, half an hour or one hour break we had. Just like, just like that we did sessions. Like after every session like that. One hour break I had thing we had. So that is also possible by us. And that was MCQs. And that is loved by the people because it's a carnival again. And that too the polling features in an academy, the special class features. It do make a lot of sense I should tell you. Anyways. Yes, Naina, half an hour. Yeah, you whether I still remember. Yes, in the discussion area will come. Don't worry. We will not miss the MCQ. Without MCQ, I will not wind up. It's a three-hour marathon, na. So I'll finish the theory now and I'll give you uh, MCQs for another one hour. It'll be even more interesting. So yes, back to the class. So this is called an expansionary monetary policy. And now, as per this expansionary monetary policy, you know, what will the RBI do? The central bank, in order to expand the money supply. Expansionary means what? Expanding the money supply, right? So now they will reduce the interest rate. If you reduce the interest rate, yeah, more money supply can come. So the public, you and me, as the citizens, we can keep the money in the hands. So expansion monetary policy, expanding will reduce interest rate. Now what is contractually the opposite of that? In the context of contractual monetary policy, you will do the opposite. You will increase the interest rate. So now, talking about the expansion monetary policy, I can tell you that the interest rate will be reduced so you can keep the money in your hands. Now, when this happens, you and me is having more money in our hands because interest rate has come down, monetary policy is expanding. So money supply is pumping into the economy. We have a more purchasing power. So we'll start consuming more and more from, uh, from the economy. More We'll start buying more goods and service. Automatically, it will avoid unemployment and recession. And even your central bank, you know, the RBA, they'll stop selling all the securities in the open market. And they'll only allow securities to be sold through member banks. Banks Automatically, economy will grow rapidly, increase the unemployment rate and also reduce the chance of recession. But you know, this, is, this can be done only for a certain limit or extent. Continuously, if money supply is increasing and the purchasing power is increasing, now inflation will come. Which is again dangerous. You understand? So now what people have said, a lot of experts or economists, what they say is that expansion monetary policy, taking into consideration this view, Inflation will not arise or it will not, price rise will not happen, they are saying, until the rise in the level of price is less than 5% for a long time. It should, it should be less than 5%, approximately 4% or 4.1, 4.2 because minimum, maximum is 6 now. But for a long time, it is in the range of 4 to 5 means, yeah, it is okay. Otherwise, what happens? Inflation ha appears means then too, uh, too much of money will start chasing too few goods. We can connect these points actually. And now, there are different types of inflation in this context, guys. Demand pull, cost pull, stagflation, deflation. What is demand pull? When there is too much of demand and less of supply. It's called as demand pull inflation, right? What is cost push? When there is too much of supply and less of demand. That is, the price rise happens now. And then they have to reduce the price. That's called as cost push inflation. Stagflation means unemployment inflation. Both are uh, factors coming. It's a kind of stagnant position. Normally, when unemployment is there, inflation should come down. But here, what they say is, when inflation is increasing, unemployment is also uh, happening over there. So it doesn't make a sense at all. That's ca called a stagnant uh, stuff. Deflation is what? The opposite of inflation. There is a decrease in the rise of rise in the prices. Whereas there is something called as disinflation. It's a medium stuff. Okay. That is, uh, disinflation is between inflation and deflation. Inflation is price rise. Deflation is, uh, you know, uh, price reduction or let's say decrease in the price level. When slowly the rate of price decreases and that rate is not that visible. That's called as disinflation, the medium category. Clear? And with regard to inflation, if you see under the expansionary monetary policy also, you have to understand what is the measurement of inflation. You can measure inflation in four ways. WPI, CPI, PPI, you can write it. 
and <coughs> GDP deflator. That is wholesale price index, consumer price index, producer price index, GDP deflator. What is the wholesale price index when you are measuring the value of goods and services at a wholesale level? Consume means from the retail level. Producer price index is something similar to the wholesale price index, but you take into consideration or you measure the price, the factory price, not the market price. And they don't take into consideration everything. So now in the context of wholesale price index, you take into consideration or you measure the value of only goods. What about services that is completely excluded? Whereas in consumer price index, both the goods and service, the value is taken into consideration. You measure the price of both the goods and service. That is why if you see uh, recently, again, in the monetary policy committee, they had to replace the wholesale price index to consumer price index as the best measure of inflation. Because it is having some sense from the retail level uh, price has been uh, you know, measured and you and me feel the pinch of paying higher prices. Wholesale means that is not happening. Retail means yeah, from the consumer price index perspective it is happening. And they also take into consideration the price of goods and service. That is the whole logic. Clear? You know what is producer price index guys? You can just have a quick revision of that as well. See, producer producer price index is nothing but it is also something similar to uh, let's say your wholesale price index. Okay. Now in the context of producer price index, they will, it will measure the average price change of goods and services. The average price, what is the change of goods and services? And you can calculate the so-called producer price index either when the goods are leaving the place of production from the factory when they are leaving or when they enter the production process. Either way you can calculate it. And in this case, when the good is leaving the production place, the factory, it is called as, uh, the out, it is known as output production uh, price index. Clear? Now, why is this PPI important, you know? The production price index is important because it's a family of indexes, I can tell you. Because it measures the average change over time, what is happening over time in the selling price. In the let's say selling price is 30 or 10 or 20 so what is happening what it is measuring the average change i can tell you over time in the say, uh, selling price which has been received by the domestic producers of goods and service so it, this is from the point of view of the producers that's why i said ppi is in the context of uh, wholesale level factory level because producer price index uh, measures price change whatever change happens in price from the perspective of the seller or the producer not the consumer you got the point. So PPI from the term producer price is associated with the seller's perspective, not the cons consumer's perspective. Is it very clear all of you? And what is GDP deflator? It's very, very important guys. GDP deflator. You come across this topic, GDP deflator. People get confused with GDP deflator and CPI, consumer price index. I'll tell you the difference quickly. See, GDP deflator measures the price of domestic expenditure or the within the country expenses because only some imports are minus out of GDP formula. Whereas consumer price index means it measures the price level of expenditure which include both domestic and foreign item. GDP deflator does not take into consideration or they do not measure the uh, price of foreign items. Whereas CPI only measures the uh, price of both domestic and foreign items. Simple as that in one single word. For you to understand what is GDP deflator and also what is CPI. So you will not confused. But if you see compared to CPI, GDP deflator is a broader measure I can tell you. Because it is including every kind of goods and service. Though CPI or consumer price index consists of all the goods and service also. Few services and goods they will eliminate here. They have a fixed basket of goods. They consist of goods and service but there is a list of goods to be included. But GDP deflator is not like that. It measures the value of all the goods and service. There is no limitations as such. There is no fixed basket as such. Whatever is produced in the economy, you measure them, the price of that, the goods and service. And when you see in that way, don't you think so? GDP deflator is a broader perspective and probably they are a better measure when you really want to know uh, about inflation. Because inflation or price rise comprises of everything. You got the point. And the second problem is the substitution bias, guys, of the CPI. In that case, yeah, GDP is, uh, deflator is quite uh, better, I can say. Is it very clear all of you till here? 
यश शंकर अचिंद्या सिंधुजा प्रिया एंड अदर्स कृति अंकित यस अंकित वेर आर यू यस कृति actually na through this topic inflation is also covered guys so we are covering half of the important topics of economy upsc in this marathon we are revising half of them because monetary policy automatically you know inflation will come in but there is no need for us to do a coverage of inflation but you know it is also important so i didn't want to quit it so it's money monetary policy banking rbi also has inflation i think i should put that title also so one thing uh, you guys can get a guarantee looking at the title of my class you should not understand only that will be discussed we have more and more insight always as how we do right that is called as the method of indelling that is a surprise you have so only if you come for the class you'll get those surprises and the benefits cuz something should be there na as a surprise as such that is why yes amanda 360 degree wala cover that is indeed very important you know that is very important anyways what is this crash what's this crash all about we were talking about inflation we were talking about those stuffs yes pradosh seems everything connected all topics easy to grasp obviously it should be because that is a whole concept see forget about marathon even if i teach you the 9:30 pm economy current affairs class in the same youtube channel i do the same thing i make a point of ensuring that yeah you guys are having the so called notion with regard to what with regard to the uh, you know connected topics important headless topics and all that makes your preparation more simplified so i can see few people saying yes in the ja kallatha this is not kallatha this is a crash i said this picture <clears throat> mcq will start in the ja once the theory is done mcq will start do not worry how can i not be without mcq is here what a question it is deflation wonderful pradosh it is deflation now the opposite of inflation when there is a fall in the supply of money and credit right and that is known by, uh, and by another name called as negative inflation because when the rate of inflation is less than 0% automatically deflation arises just for you to know i gave it okay now it's a downward movement in the general price level i can say that is price of goods and services will decrease but the buying power of money will increase so what happen you will be able to buy more items with very less investment but that is bad for the economy you cannot grow the economy like that now there are different type of deflation money side supply side deflation credit deflation debt deflation just for you to know i gave it from these areas 101% no questions will come maybe from deflation it can come but money side supply side credit deflation debt deflation no questions will come so we can just skip it okay now the next important point is how does monetary policy works that is very very important as i told you expansionary contractionary i taught you what is expansionary so it will be easy for you to understand what is contractionary now think about the example of the rubber band the elastic nature of it they expand and they contract so when they expand and contract what happens when you expand you have more space when you contract you have less space the same situation applies to monetary policy also so now in the context of cash rate interest rate economic activity inflation we have to connect this uh, you know contractionary and expansionary monetary policy okay here we have contraction in monetary policy and this is one of the most used monetary policy as yes, a uh, policies guys that is out of expansion and contraction which is the most used monetary policies of course contraction in monetary policy because we are dealing with the issue of inflation every now and then so to help maintaining the rate of inflation to help reducing inflation rate chalo you need to have contraction in monetary policy no doubt in that so that is why it is said that it is one of the most used monetary policies every now and then clear and the main tools of this policies what are they point number 1 interest rate and security options you tell me in a contractionary monetary policy what happens to interest rate will it increase or decrease do they have a positive relation or a negative relation quick come on yaar answer should be fatta fat the faster yaar it will obviously increase the opposite wonderful pradosh yes because at when i taught you expansionary monetary policy what did i tell you when one increase the other decrease so contraction means decrease automatically interest will increase opposite relationship you got the point so contraction monetary policy means when the central bank or the rbi is adopting such kind of contraction monetary policy they will try to increase the interest rate why because uh, the people will keep their money in the bank that is when there is a contraction monetary policy money supply is less so to uh, to in order to save their money because interest rates are higher and the people will go to the bank and they'll stock up their money so they will get better interest rate automatically what happened 
you and me, we having 10 lakhs in hand. With the 10 lakh, suddenly you, uh, the RB is adopting contractual monetary policy. You understand that interest rate will increase. What will you do? Instead of uh, you know keeping the money at your home or investing somewhere, for tough it will go to bank and deposit because you are getting a higher interest rate. So the circulation of money supply in your hand decreases. As a result, inflation will also decrease. Because there is too much of money supply, inflation of price rise happened. So too much of uh, money will start chasing too few goods. To control that and to ensure the situation is normal, the contractual monetary policy will be adopted by the RBI, in which they will increase the interest rate. That is one way. Second way of contractual monetary policy is what you know. The central bank will also sell off securities in the open market. So open market uh, securities OMO is one of the instruments used by monetary policy RB, which I will be discussing with you. They will sell. When you sell the security, automatically the economy is buying from you. The market is buying from you. So they, the RB will get money from the market. So they are in, sucking out the money from the economy and controlling the situations. You got the point. So why they are doing that? To adjust this condition in the economy, like to decrease or lower the inflation rate. Clear? Yes, Priya, OM open market operation. We will be studying about that now. Do not worry. In the current affairs, we will study. What is expansionary guys now having understood contraction? The opposite. Expansionary means again inflation is reduced. Here uh, to avoid recessions we bring this expansionary and here the interest rate is reduced. Simple as that. So people can keep money in their hands. Basically for avoiding unemployment recession you go for such kind of expansion monetary policy. In the expansion monetary policy also central bank will stop selling securities in the open market. They will allow securities to be sold only among the member banks. Just because the economy has to grow rapidly. See both the situations you try to manage the economy. Based on the economy situations, we apply expansionary contractionary as and when it is feasible. You can see in expansionary, taxes will come down. Spending of government will increase because you got to maintain the economy. That is in order to fight a recession. When the economy is in the uh, recession stage, let's take the case of COVID-19 pandemic, you have to bring the economy back to track. So it will decrease all the taxation uh, rates and everything. So people will have more money with them and the government will start spending. Or the expenditure activity of government for various social, social welfare activity increases. So we are expanding the money supply. Contraction means what? It is again the same thing. The taxes are decreased, expenditure increase. But here it is to compact inflation. Contraction is basically to reduce inflation. Whereas expansionary monetary policy is done to uh, fight a recession. So keep these keywords in mind. This would do the needful whenever you think about expansionary monetary policy and contractionary monetary policy. Even if you do not remember the theory also, this particular chart or uh, graph will enable you to have a crystal clear understanding of what these concepts are all about. Clear? Yes, Ankit, what is the point basis, ma'am? Like RB reduces by 25 point basis. That is for the uh, repo rate and reverse repo rate. 0.25 and all this stuff, basis. I will come to that. Those, those are current affairs things. That we will study in the current affairs part of the tools and uh, policies. Clear? Perfect. So now, here we go. This is, I, I can say, the highlighted killer hitless topic. I won't say it is a hitless topic, rather killer hitless topic. Why? Because every year you can see at least one question coming from the instruments or tools used by RBI to control money supply or the instruments or tools of monetary policy. The quantitative and the qualitative instruments. Out of that, the quantitative instruments are very, very important. Every now and then in the newspaper also, revolving these quantitative instruments, repo rate, reverse repo rate, CRR, bank rate, open market operations, your questions come. Or let's say the news come. Right? So don't you think so it's quite important uh, for you to have a quick look? And I know that you are all so well versed in this topic, but still... Here we are going to have a quick revision in this marathon session exclusively on this particular broad area along with the trending current affairs. Here we go. There are two types of controlling credit. Credit means what money supply. Or let's say the tools or instruments used by RBI to control inflation. Quantitative, qualitative. In this, quantitative is more, more, more important. From qualitative method, very few chances are there for questions to come. It is not that important compared to quantitative. But 101% question will come from this area. That I guarantee you guys. No doubt in that. Clear? Yes, Priya. Ma'am, in contractory, contractionary monetary policy, tax will increase or decrease. See, in contractionary, interest rate will increase. So, tax will also decrease.
here we go and these quantitative uh, tools of monetary policy or RBA it is also called as what traditional measures or traditional tools or instruments or let's say conventional one traditional or conventional tools or measures of monetary policy whereas qualitative is called as uh, selective measures clear and quantitative is also called as general measures guys there are different different names out there but anyways now what are quantitative guys basically these are the various methods employed by the central bank of a country RBA why because they want to control the credit creation of money supply power of whom of the commercial banks and you can classify them into so and so so quantitative they basically is to regulate the volume of credit or money created by the banking system qualitative is just to regulate the flow of credit in for particular uses that is why i told you that quantitative is having more important because the usage is higher compared to qualitative methods you very frequently tend to apply the quantitative or the traditional methods because it includes the bank rate policy the open market operations the reserve ratios like crv slr the, uh, the laf liquidity adjustment facility or let's say the repo rate reverse repo rate marshall standing facility etc etc but now as far as recent current affairs is concerned it is even more interesting to understand that since the quantitative or the traditional or the conventional methods of monetary policy was a failure really it was a failure we can't say the success in this covid and in pandemic we tried but still we had to uh, keep all these methods constant so there were a lot of suggestions coming up to use the unconventional or the uh, you know non traditional monetary policy tools like helicopter money quantitative easing long term repo operations target uh, long term repo operations that is tltro etc etc all these things i've taught you for the 10 10 minutes class remember concept in current affairs a quick revision of that we'll be uh, putting it out here yes pray if qualitative doesn't work qualitative is used no 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 that is not the case uh, men priya quantitative and qualitative are different see quantitative is very very important qualitative cannot be applied for all the situation you cannot use to control money supply for every situation it is very selective for one particular specific purpose or use only you can apply this technique it consists of uh, methods like regulation of margin requirement credit rationing regulation of consumer credit direct action and all you got the point only for these things you can use it these these are the methods that comes under that it is for particular uses not for general use we are talking about the general perspective so only quantitative can be used see if that was a case if quantitative was not working properly then you can use qualitative means why would we we go for the unconventional or the non traditional monetary policy tools like helicopter money quantitative easing uh, long term repo operations ltro etc why this is the current affairs is studying these days and you may get a question from this un unconventional monetary policy tools guys maybe they are same questions what we did in the plus and the free class in an academy can also come so it all depends now let's have a quick look into this quantitative method it's quite important for us to have a quick look into this right a quick revision i should tell you indeed a quick revision of this that that will be the most uh, you know proper way to say i can say here we go what an amazing picture hai na you come this side or you come that side it's difficult for me to adjust that's that's what the picture is not you know <laughs> telling you hai na so it is very difficult to adjust it accordingly you have to adjust uh, you know here and there so let's quickly have a look into what are the quantitative or the traditional measures of monetary policy quick revision in that so you have the bank rate the point number 1 bank rate or discount rate it's very very important or interest rate i can tell you followed by omo open market operations then the reserve ratios called as crr and slr such uh, sorry cash reserve ratio and saturated liquidity ratio these are very very important followed by laf what is laf liquidity adjustment facility and under that it is again subdivided into the two important ones Re repo rate and reverse repo rate and then your marshall standing facility all these things are just coming under that but these are the most most important quantitative methods of monetary policy or measures of monetary policy clear 
So here we go, the bank rate or the interest rate or the discount rate, very important. So now the very, very first important quantitative instrument of monetary policy. It's very important, guys, this area. So please pay attention. Take a piece of paper or a notebook and write it along with me. Put the, I know you all know this, but do the revision along with me. So you'll be able to uh, do, uh, you know, an amazing revision. Uh, even for examination, it will help you to a greater extent. So what is bank rate, guys? It is the minimum rate. And the rate at which the central bank of a country will provide loan to the commercial bank. That is when RBI is giving loan to commercial bank at a minimum rate. Now, when loan has been given by the RBI to the commercial bank at a minimum rate, automatically we, the consumers or the customers, benefit. Because we go to these commercial banks, state bank or Kendra bank or Indian bank or any other bank and get the loan. So, commercial bank will be able to give us loan at a lower uh, interest rate. If it is a higher interest rate, what happens then? The interest rate uh, will be increasing uh, will be increased for us also by the commercial bank. Because they end up paying high interest rate at RBI now. So, they have to get the profit. So they will uh, put the burden on us. Automatically, people will not want to take a loan. So the money supply will decrease. So there are a lot of repercussions like that. And many times the bank rate being the minimum rate, they are also called as in discount rate. Because the kind of, uh, because the central bank, right, or RBI, they are providing a finance to commercial banks and they are doing it by rediscounting the bills. That's why it is called as, uh, you know, discount rate. And thus, the RBI will use this bank rate. Why? Because they want to control the money supply of credit in the account. That's the sole reason why you use this. Clear? Let's take the case of inflation. When there is a price rise, why would RBI use bank rate? RBI will definitely increase the bank rate. There is too much of price rise. Okay. Inflation is happening. Now, RBI will slowly increase the bank rate in the economy. Automatically, people uh, will not borrow from commercial bank. You and me will not borrow because interest rate is high. So, the cost of borrowings also increases. Automatically, it will discourage the commercial banks like State Bank or Canara Bank to, uh, uh, you know, it will discourage them to borrow from RBI. Automatically, what happened? Economy will fall along with increase in lending rates by commercial bank. Then the dis in investment will be discouraged. Automatically, aggregate demand and total demand, everything will come down. So when there is a fall in the aggregate or total demand, what happens? Automatically, aggregate or total demand, if there is a fall, it will lead to reduction in income and output in the economy. Thus, inflation will subside. Slowly, you can reduce it. Clear? And vice versa. The opposite uh, case, RBI will decrease the bank rate and do stuff. Clear? This is how practically it works. That's enough with regard to bank rate. And the current bank rates and all, I'll tell you. Nothing to worry because these are theoretical things. So just finish it off. And then we'll go to current affairs. Next important instrument is OM, open market operation. In one simple term, I can tell you, it deals with the purchase and the sale of government securities by the RBI. What are government securities? I've told you this before. What are government securities or GSECs? Government securities, what are they? These are simple, simple things which you should know actually. They are debt instruments. I repeat, government securities are debt instruments of so, uh, sovereign government. And the government securities, they come in variety of forms. But the very best example of a government security is T-bills or treasury bills or T-bills, uh, I can tell you. Clear? And also the notes. Clear? So, treasury bills or T-bills, which is having a very, uh, you know, less risk factor than cash management bills or CMBS. Then state development loans, SDLS, all these are examples of government securities, okay? Now, the purchase and sale of securities by the RBI is called as open market operation. Now, when there is too much of money supply, what will RBI do? They will say, okay, to control this money supply and because too much of money supply, inflation will be there. To control that, the RBI will start selling the securities in the open market. When the open market is purchasing from RBI, money is in, uh, you know sucked from the economy. So slowly, too much of money supply, inflation can be controlled. Similarly, when there is no money supply, that is in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. What did we do? We wanted to inject money supply. Now RBI used open market operation to uh, purchase. Purchase what? Purchase securities from the open market. They purchase and RBI is purchasing automatically. Money flows from uh, RBI to the economy. When there is too much of money supply, what will RBI do? RBI will sell the security. So when you sell, market is buying and they uh, the money is coming to RBI. But when there is no money supply, RBI will start purchasing. When RBI is purchasing, uh, automatically RBI has to give money to the economy. So money supply will increase. Clear? This is how open market operation has been practically utilized. In this particular context, you can connect this with what you know, your operation twist, which is a US, uh, you know, style. I have taught you this in the 9.30 p.m. current affairs class. Very recently also I've taught you this. Open market operations, current affairs is operation twist. You can write it. 
current affairs of this topic is operation twist it is a process in uh, which the central bank or rbi for india it is rbi for us it is federal reserve bank or fdr that is there is central bank for rbi so in general operation twist is when the central bank will use the proceeds or income they get from the sale of short term securities okay from the sale of short term securities why because they want to buy long term government bonds sorry not bond uh, they want to buy long term government debt uh, papers automatically what happens it will lead to easing of interest rate in the long term papers and this is not a new thing guys it's it appeared way back in the year 1961 operation twist i can tell you and that is basically done by the uh, federal reserve bank of us they wanted to strengthen the us dollar and stimulate cash flow in the economy that is why us economy did in the year 1961 something called as operation twist in the year june 2012 what happened this so called operation twist i can tell you it was so effective that your yield or a income on the 10 year us treasury dropped to a 200 low and now how was this connected to a country in case we want to adopt this operation twist of us i can tell you the rbi has announced that it will carry out the us style operation twist why because we want to bring the interest rate down so for that the rbi said they will conduct simultaneous purchase and sale of open market of government securities via open market operations for 10000 crore in each they'll purchase long term maturities and that's what they did for this operation twist clear and the whole point is guys through this operation twist now you will be able to encourage uh, that is it is done by the rbi for uh, as an encouragement for the market and this step may be a driving factor for the long term economic activity and for any addition of new investment stock and all so this is what you should study with regard to the operation twist current affairs pertaining to this topic open market operation nothing more is required these many points whatever i have taught you is perfectly perfectly fine yes indraja yes pradosh i have taught you in the uh, 9:30 pm class but a quick revision see I, that uh, we may, we would have studied that uh, let's say in 5 uh, 5 to 10 minutes but here within less than 5 minutes in 3 to 4 minutes or let's say 3 minutes i finished the same topic so the more and more when you revise you see the duration of you getting the same thing also decreases and you are able to revise them fatafat like that your brain is working like a fast track robot i can say ha na i should start developing a upsc robot for you people your brains are like that now <laughs> indeed you should be happy for the same anyways and by the way let me ask you something yaar are you bored it's been more than 2 hours we started at 7 7 to 8 8 to 9 it's like more than 2 hours continuous classes how do you feel do you feel bored be honest no kalla terms or you're feeling that josh yes kriti economics was chitti yeah we will have to have a chitti in the plus class don't worry i'll come with more of chittis in the mcq class acha josh learning kya baat hai because marathons is something you know probably with the theory and all people get to feel that but i'm so happy that you people are literally interested in this wonderful that's a great great uh, you know energy for us to keep doing such marathons i should tell you <laughs> anyways back to class so having understood the current affairs and the concept of the second instrument of monetary policy let's move to the next instrument and the same thing what have i told you i've explained it here also the next instrument is what the next instrument of monetary policy is the reserve requirement i repeat reserve requirement in a very very simple term i'll tell you reserve requirements can be categorized into two one is crr cash reserve ratio next is slr such a liquidity ratio what is crr the amount of reserve it could be in the form of gold it could be in the form of securities or whatever the amount of reserve that the commercial banks like state bank or canara bank will have to deposit with rbi it is compulsory the amount of reserve the, state, uh, the commercial bank have to deposit with rbi is called as cash reserve ratio now let's say for example previously before the uh, liberalization privatization globalization between the 1990 card reforms the new economic policy there was no much reforms in the banking sector and all so the the cash reserve ratio all was like 15 percentage that is for example if a commercial bank is having let's say state bank is having 100 crore with them okay they have to maintain 15 percentage or let's say 20 percentage of that they have to maintain that money with the rbi it's compulsory condition as a reserve and the rbi will not give them any interest and all just like that they have to keep which means uh, 20% of 100 crore is 20 crore so remaining 80 crore is only available with the state bank to give it as loans to the people don't you think it's too much because see the money of the commercial bank is decreasing when they are keeping a huge amount of money as reserve with the rbi you can keep the money as a reserve with rbi but 
you are not getting any benefit out of it but it's a mandatory condition so let the reserve ratio be less that is why after so much of reserve and to increase the money supply and for the economy to grow to give more loans and to have more investments in production in the economy from 15% it became to 4% the ideal is 4% today i can tell you that the crr it is uh, you know literally i can tell you that the crr is uh, literally 3.5% to 4% ratio because that is kind of feasible and convenient you got the point that is the whole point to be understood in the context of crr what about uh, you know yes sindhuja what happened where are you going two to three on a heads i'll give wait mcq will come now so now this is called a crr and that's for example as i told you the legal crr is 10 percent and the bank will have to keep rupees 100 as reserve against a deposit of 1000 the example I've told you, it's, uh, you know, 100 crore and 20%. You can keep that in mind. What about SLR? That is also a reserve requirement. And the reason uh, why you have CRR is because why you know. For example, there is too much of inflation in the economy. Now, to control, uh, to control the inflation, or let's say to control the money supply, too much of money supply, RBA will increase the CRR. That is more of deposits the commercial bank have to give with RBA, so less of money supply will happen. So, inflation can be reduced. And vice versa. That is how they do practically. Now, the next is SLR, that is saturatory liquidity ratio. The meaning of that is SLR is nothing but the amount of reserve the commercial bank have to keep with themselves. I repeat, the, uh, the commercial bank have to keep with themselves. That is again for their safety and the emergency fund, I can say. So, in, they will not uh, fall in trouble. Clear? Here, RBA is not coming with, let's say the states or Kendra Bank will have to keep with themselves. That is the whole logic here. So, the rate of SLR is always in the terms of two digits. It was 25, 28, 30 percent and all. Now, it has become 18.5 to 18 percentage. The current SLR is 18 percentage and the current CRR is 3.5 to 4 percentage. I think it's 3.5 now. Clear? So, you will think that SLR is a two digit number. So, that is very important. No. Though SLR is a two digit figure also, always your cash reserve ratio, even if it is a single digit number, of 4% it is very very important because here the commercial bank is having an interaction with the RBI. They are keeping the amount of reserve in the form of cash or security or gold or whatever with the RBI. Whereas SLR means it is with, within the bank. It is internal. No external factors coming. So that is why CR is very very important. Clear? So this is also one important point to be noted. Now the next important instrument is LAF. Liquidity Adjustment Facility. That is it is a repurchase agreement. So, this is an instrument, monetary policy instrument, which is allowing the commercial bank and all the primary dealers, guys, they can borrow money through a repurchase agreement. And this LAF is again classified into repo rate and reverse repo rate. So, why do you have this facility called as LAF? Because you want to help the bank in adjusting the day-to-day -day fluctuations in money supply and all. Right? So, RBA will extend the LAF or let's say this uh, adjustment facility only to those commercial banks, excluding regional rural bank because that is for the rural perspective and the primary dealers. They will not uh, give it to your non-banking financial companies or NBFCs and all. Clear? So, under the repurchase agreement or LAF, what will uh, happen? They will allow the commercial banks to park their excess money. With whom? With the RBI. If there is, for example, there is too much of money supply in the economy. Now, in that case, they can keep the excess money with RBI or they can even get liquidity from the RBI in, in, in times when they do not have money at all. So, that is how the LAF works. Now, in this repo and reverse repo rate is very important. What is repo rate? The rate, very simple, the rate at which RBI will borrow from, sorry, the rate at which commercial banks will borrow from RBI. That is CB. CB is borrowing from RBI, commercial bank. What would reverse repo rate when RBI is borrowing from commercial banks? You got the point. That is repo rate is, wait, repo rate is when commercial bank borrows from RBI, the arrow goes like this and reverse repo rate is opposite arrow when the RBI is borrowing from commercial banks. Clear? And again the rate is like 3.5%, 6.5%, like that 6%, 6.5%, it keeps changing. And now it is for a short period of time. This repo rate, reverse repo rate and all, it's for a short period of time the borrowings. Within less than one year and all they borrow, not more than that. So it's a short term borrowing again. You can just keep it in mind. 
there are a lot of current affairs in this context, I'll tell you. Now, this repo rate, what do they do basically? They'll inject money into the system because RBI is, commercial banks are borrowing from RBI. So they're getting money. Whatever reverse guys, RBI is taking from commercial banks. So RBI is taking the money back from the commercial to them. So money supply is decreasing. So repo rate is injecting money into the system whereas reverse repo is taking money out of the system. So RBI will increase repo rate when? During time of inflation. Too much of price rise means they will increase the repo rate because rate at which commercial banks borrow from RBI, they'll increase it. Automatically, inflation can be balanced. Clear? And they'll decrease uh, the repo rate when there's, uh, when there's a deflation. So there is more money supply. Clear? And one important point is that using the facility of liquidity adjustment uh, rate facility, na, they do not allow the banks to borrow the unlimited amount from RBI. They can borrow only the permitted, uh, you know, or let's say limited percentage. They can borrow only a limited percentage of its NDLT. What is that? Net demand and time liabilities under the liquidity adjustment facility. They cannot borrow just like that. There is a limit within that they can borrow for a short time. So those kind of things are to be understood in the context of the LAF facility, which is repo rate and reverse repo rate. Now, in this context, it is very, very important for you to have an understanding of the next important uh, instrument or tool of RBI called as MSF, Marshall Standing Facility. It is a new scheme introduced by RBI in the year 2011-12. Okay. What are they? Marginal standing facility or MSF is also penal rate. Now, this is also something similar to our repo rate. So, you'll be confused. But I'll make it more simplified for you. Repo rate is also the rate at which RBI is borrowing from, sorry, commercial bank is borrowing from RBI. MF is also the penal rate at which the commercial banks can borrow from RBI. But here, it is over and above what, what they can borrow from RBI under the LAF window. That is why I taught to you that under repo rate, you can borrow in a limit. You cannot borrow after the limit. But in MSF, that is not the case. You can borrow even after the limit. And now, marginal standing facility is like overnight funds. Overnight, you can borrow the fund. There is a huge emergency happening. So, repo rate means at least one day it will take for you to get the fund and there is a limit. But MSF means fatafat like that, in overnight, you can borrow the funds. That is the biggest advantage. Clear? Yes, Amudan? And this penal rate called as MSF, uh, they are always fixed at a higher rate compared to repo rate. Because overnight, for tough like this, you're getting the money in the same borrowing thing only of the commercial banks, uh, the borrow, uh, commercial banks borrow from RBA, but it is faster. The faster you get, the uh, higher uh, the demand also, right? Simple as that. And this MSF, I can tell you, it will be a penal rate for the banks as a whole because uh, the bank can borrow funds by and they can do that by pledging their government security as a collateral within the so-called limits of SLR, etc, etc. But why do you think such kind of marginal standing facility has to be introduced, guys? See, it has been introduced by RBI. And the aim is nothing but they want to reduce vol volatility in the overnight lending rates uh, and all the interbank market and all. So you will be able to have a smooth monetary or money supply transmission in the entire financial system. That is the biggest, biggest reason why they do all this. Clear? Here we have SLR. SLR, I already taught you what is it. <clears throat> So here we go guys, you can see a few current affairs clippings what I've brought in with regard to SLR and CRR and all. Bank cuts the base rate as RBI lowers repo rate by 25 BPS. What Ankit has asked in the class. All these current affairs will pop up here. These are old current affairs when uh, RBI governor Raghuram Rajan was there. That time, but I'm just showing you, this is how it uh, goes. But this is not important for you now, so that's why I'm not taking it. Now, the next important uh, quantitative instruments or traditional instruments of monetary policy is base rate. What is base rate? It is the minimum interest rate of a bank below which it cannot uh, lend. It is not having a permission to lend. There is a minimum rate. That is, let's say 8% is minimum rate. Below 8%, the bank cannot even think of renting, lending the money. You got the point. It's called as base rate. But there are some exceptions allowed uh, by the RBI in some cases. So, base rate is the minimum interest rate that the bank must charge. Because below the base rate, it is not viable or feasible for a bank to lend. They cannot do that. There is no permission. And since 2011, July, the so-called base rate was introduced by the whom, guys? The RBI. Or oh, that's the Reserve Bank of India. And they are the new benchmark rate for the lending operations of the bank. Clear? Is it very clear? I have taught you this also, this base rate also. Because base rate and MCLR, you have to understand. What is base rate and MCLR? Marginal cost of lending rate and base rate. You remember I have taught you. 
based on enrollment, minimum rate at which uh, you cannot uh, lend. I mean, after that, marginal cost of lending rate or MCLR. What are they? They are also something similar to that. What are they? They appear to be quite similar because marginal cost of lending rate is something which is again rated with minimum rate which the banks cannot lend. But there are few re revisions to happen in the context of uh, you know MCLR. That is why they were revised. And today we have something called as base rate I can tell you. Right. So now marginal cost of fund based lending rate refers to the minimum interest rate that must be charged for lending. That is after the minimum you cannot decrease. That's the whole point. You cannot lend below, below that. And the bank cannot grant any loan below, the, uh, loan below that particular rate I can tell you except in few cases and if you see since 2016 oh sorry guys a few uh, uh, revision of uh, points to be noted I taught you regarding MC base rate now the base rate is re revised with MCLR MCLR is a new thing okay marginal cost of lending rate is a new thing base rate was there bank base rate was before because of some uh, you know loopholes in that they were revised with in the year 2016 after five years with a new uh, rate called as marginal cost of lending rate both the concepts are having the same meaning. The only point is that there is more transparency in the context of MCLR. That is why they replace the bank base rate with the MCLR. Clear? And thus the base rate. They replaced something called as BPLR guys. That is a benchmark prime lending rate. But then there were some loopholes so they went to the MCLR. Clear? Okay. Then the qualitative measures of RBA, just for you to have a look into it, what they are, just, just for you to have a look. Credit rationing, change in lending margin, model situation, direct control, all these are just for you to read. Uh, no questions will come from them. So I'm just skipping it off. But you should know what they are. So I'll just quickly tell you in one, one line what they are. So fixing margin requirements, for example, again, when there's a situation of uh, inflation or money supply issues, now the margin refers to what the proportion of the loan amount that is not financed by the bank. That is a part of loan which a borrower has to raise in order to get finance for his purpose. For example, 10 lakh is a loan that you need. Bank is approving only 6 lakh. Remaining 4 lakh, what will you do? You have to raise it by your own. So such kind of margin requirements have to be fixed. You are getting the loan from the bank, they are helping you. But then, not completely. The approval is only 6 lakh. What about the 4 lakh? So you got to find a source for that. You got the point. So when there is a change in margin, they imply a change in loan size. So and this particular method has been used by the bank uh, or RBA to encourage what the money supply of credit for all the important or the priority or the needy sector. And so then you can, uh, so that all the non-needy or other uh, sectors can be avoided. Clear? For example, if RBA is feeling that more credit or money should be given to agricultural sector, they can do that. You can connect this with the PSL, priority sector lending. No, it's not the RBA doing that. They're giving more importance to agriculture and to other sectors which they feel it is priority important. So, your fixing margin requirements or the qualitative measures are done by the RBA in the policy making perspective of allocating more loans to the priority sectors to help them have a more credit or money supply to pitch up that particular sector and all. Clear? Then consumer credit regulation. That is in the context of the installment guys. Here the consumer money supply credit supply is regulated through higher purchase and installment sale of consumer. Your down payment installment, even if you want to take, if you want to, uh, you know, these days when people want to buy some appliances, when they want to buy a car or home or all, many a times, even if you have so much of money also, the ones with brains now, they will opt for, uh, you know, installments or let's say EMIs only or they'll finance it because when it comes to IT, income tax returns, see, I'm not selling any kallathanams, don't follow this and all, <laughs> you know, you can show the data and you can escape. This is what people does. That's what I'm telling you. So on this method, the down payment EMI amount and all that is fixed in advance. So people prefer for that. So you have to fix all these in advance. Otherwise, it will be a problem. So it's a credit regulation of the consumer as such, I can say. What is this? Publicity. This is yet again another method of selective credit control. Here, the RBA, though we publish various reports stating what is good and what is bad also, many a times. Even the commercial banks and the public doesn't know what to follow. That is the reality I can say. The so-called RBA's bi-monthly report, that report from www.rba.org.in. You remember, that is a site you can get it. But in spite of that, what is happening? 
you got the point so all those kind of things you can just go through see through the weekly and monthly bulletins of rbi the information is made public and the banks can use it for attaining goals of monetary policy but many times they are not able to reach it. those are all the qualitative thing then credit rationing next thing that is central bank fixes the credit amount to be granted and that has been done credit is rationed by limiting the amount available for every commercial bank this is the money that state bank should have this is the money that canara bank should have they kind of fix a limit for everything and they can even uh, control the bill rediscounting guys through credit rationing i can tell you for this what they will do is they'll uh, have a upper limit of credit and the banks are told to stick to this limit so unwanted or let's say uh, you know there are few sectors unnecessary unwanted sectors you can lower bank credit exposure to those sectors and divert the money for the productive activities or the important sectors which will boost up the growth of the economy so credit rationing is done uh, for those pers- perspective kind of segregating the loan amount has been going to the correct purpose clear then moral suasion those are just to ensure a better credit control for financial emergency crisis to get the money all those stuff now here we have the banking this is something which we know right the bank what is a bank an institution which accept deposits and also which lend uh, lend the, the same money back to the person right so between the borrower a saver and the borrower the bank will act as a intermediary so the interest that the bank gets from the people that is the profit for them and at the same time when the people go and deposit money in the bank the bank gives them an interest but very less amount of interest but the interest that they charge from the public whom they give as loan is quite high because that is a profit of a bank so you can just go through so financial intermediation is an important term to be noted in the context of bank the functions of bank we all know primary secondary functions uh, accept deposit uh, lending uh, money you can just go through i have just given all these things these are just for you to go go through take care this particular slide now what is more important is financial intermediation that is what is that basically basically financial intermediation is what you know it is a process of taking funds from the depositor that is for example i am going to deposit 20 lakhs or let's say 50 lakh in the bank now from i am depositing 50 lakh now what you will do as a bank commercial bank you will take that money and give it to somebody else you will give it to sindhuja or to kriti or tamanta whoever comes to the bank for the loan perspective so circulation is happening bank is a intermediary person there so through this process of financial intermediary the banks are able to transform the assets into liabilities so thus promoting economic growth by channelizing funds from those who have surplus money to those who do not have is actually a kind of productive investment that's called as financial intermediation clear and now this is quite important for you why i gave you this is the type or structure of banks in india is this is something which is very very important to be noted guys with rbi you should know what is rbi you should know what the commercial banks credit ones then the rrb the foreign banks the cooperative banks and all these are quite important for you to do a revision rbi the most important one right we all know that in fact the central bank of a country which is the bankers bank which regulates every other uh, banks in our country right because as per the guidelines of rbi only things can take place and they are the only one to print the currencies and uh, coins except one rupee note every other coins or currency is being printed by the rbi because government of india ministry of finance they print the one rupee note even today that has been done right because in one rupee note you can find the signature of the secretary of uh, you know financial ministry not rbi governor's ka signature so those kind of points can be noted this is just a quick revision recap of all those what you studied now the different kind of banks public sector private sector corporate sector regional sector foreign banks oh my goodness all these come under the context called as scheduled banks what are scheduled banks guys see all the commercial banks in our country india they are of two categories scheduled and non scheduled which comes under the banking regulation act of 1949 so any bank which comes under the uh, second schedule of rbi is considered scheduled bank state bank and all the subsidiaries like state bank sbt then bank of baroda bank of india private banks foreign banks rrb cooperative banks all these are commercial scheduled commercial banks what about non scheduled commercial banks do not come under the, that particular list i can say right and now if you see till 2017 uh, scheduled commercial banks in india was 26 uh, had 26 public sector banks including sbi and the associate and also 19 nationalized banks and idbi but now it has been increasing over the time i can tell you because banking sector as a whole is progressing now that is why now out of that rrb is very important they are also one of the scheduled commercial bank and since 1970 this has been there in our country india that is because though we had commercial bank also now lending to the agriculture sector the farmers or the rural people that was not done properly so exclusively for the development of rural area only rrb was put forward so rbi was controlling them 
But now since the burden was too much for RBI, they appointed another authority called as NABAT, National Agriculture Bank, National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development. They are the ones who will regulate the RRBs and all. But they come under the purview of RBI, but they have some discretion as such. So uh, this is how the working goes. Clear? This is an example of non-scheduled commercial banks, guys. The banks that are not listed in the second schedule of the RBI's Act of 34. And a bank which is having a reserve capital of less than 5 lakh rupees. They are called as non-scheduled banks. And Jammu and Kashmir Bank could be a best example of non-scheduled banks, I can tell you. And see, scheduled banks and all, they can borrow from RBI. But in uh, non-scheduled, they cannot borrow from RBI. Okay, that is, they, they cannot borrow from RBI in the context, that is, except for the normal banking purpose. Only in emergency or abnormal situation, they can borrow. Other than that, for the normal thing, they cannot borrow. That is a privilege given to the scheduled commercial banks. Clear? What are cooperative banks? Both in urban and non-urban areas, they do operate. And they come under the Cooperative Societies Act of 1912. And in urban centers, they mainly finance entrepreneurs, all the small small chuttawala business, the self-employment people, the MSMEs, uh, all these things. Because these days, that is uh, more uh, rising. And also, if you see majority of people in our country, they put up in the informal sector. More than 90% of the population. And uh, unemployment is uh, even a big issue. So, MSME, self-employment, all these people require money. Where will they go? So, they'll go to cooperative banks. Even uh, home buying, education loans, small, small wala loans, na, important one, they take care of it. So basically in rural areas also you can find cooperative banks, uh, basically to cater to all the needs of agriculture activity. Though you have regional rural banks also, cooperative banks also per, uh, per, uh, you know, present in the rural area. Clear? It's basically to improve that area or uh, that uh, you know part of our country to a greater extent, that is why. And who regulates cooperative banks? Is it NABAD or some other society? No. Directly, they come under the purview of the Central Bank of a country, India, RBI, under the Banking Regulation Act of 1949 and also the Banking Laws Act of 1965. Clear? Here you have something about the DFIs, Development Finance Institution. You can just go through. What are they? Okay. These are not that required. Just for you to know, I've given the notes. Now, what is more important? is the current affairs of all these guys. Now, here we go. The important current affairs. Let's quickly have a look into it. Already? So here we go. We'll talk about the MPC, the objectives, the highlights of RBI's monetary policy, important rates, inflation targeting, DSI, domestically systematic insurers, because pre, uh, last year domestic systematic bank was important. Today it is insurers. Then helicopter money, quantitative easing, LTRO, TLTR and also SBIs. With regard to your reduction in the MCLR, this is what we'll be doing. Quick look into that. MPC, constituted by the RBI, led by the governor of RBI, there are three members. I told you what is MPC in the beginning of the class. Remember, you can just revise that. The same thing. It is formed by uh, with the mission of what? Fixing the benchmark policy rate, that is repo rate. So to control inflation within the particular target level. 4% with a uh, band of plus or minus 2%. 2, 4, 6. 6 is maximum, 2 is minimum. 4 is ideal. And how many members? Three from RBI, three from Government of India, right? For a period of four years. And if you see this MPC, again, they were put up under the RBI Act of 1934. And at least four times a year they made. This year it was six to seven, uh, six to seven times because of COVID-19 pandemic. And again, monetary policy objective, we saw that. And how was monetary policy formed? Again, I told you, remember, Urzit Bridal Committee. He was the first person, when he was a deputy governor, he proposed it. It was later accepted. It was actually a seven-member committee, but then they said, no, let's make it six. Three from Arbe, three from uh, Government of India. Initially, they said five people. Then they said seven. Finally, it became six. So in the year 20, 2016, it came into force. And the FMOD, that is Financial Market Operation Department, they only operationalize the monetary policy. And mainly, they do that through their day-to-day -day liquidity management operations, I can tell you. Clear? So who is the governor guys? Current governor, Sakitinda Das. Then in charge of monetary policy is Dr. Michael. Then member, all the members have given just for you to know, just to have a practical uh, understanding. All the economists, business experts, I mean, the economists, financial analysts, they only are a part of this. Mostly economists and uh, people of that category. Which is the five important rates. This is a very, very recent data. That is, today is uh, 26. Yesterday's data, last updated in the www.rba.org.in recent data yesterday's data guys after that is not updated the reverse repo rate it is 3.35 percent repo is four percent cr is three c four is the maximum it has been reduced to three now again because of covid and in pandemic and bank rate has become 4.25 
SLR is the same. It is 18 percentage. No change in that. Clear? So, fatafat, fatafat, take a piece of paper or notebook, write these rates. I have just gave it in the, uh, you know, slide. So, you will be able to understand it in a better way. Clear? So now, in this month, 6th August 2021, some highlights was put forward by RBI with regard to monetary policies. Take care. What was that? They said that in the RBI's bi-monthly policy report, I repeat, bi-monthly policy report, the repo rate, they will remain unchanged. No change. Same 4%. Even the reverse repo rate, the rate at which commercial bank borrow from RBI and RBI borrow from commercial bank, it them same. 4%, 3.5%. Even the cash reserve ratio, they said it will be the same. Everything was same. See, there is no point of view increasing or decreasing taking into consideration the current economic situations. We can't say that the economy is fully full-fledged into track. Still, we have lockdowns. Still, we have restrictions in workplace. We do not have the full employment and productivity uh, happening out there. So, all the rates are kind of constant. Clear? They fall in a similar pattern. <coughs> to ensure stability. <clears throat> now, they even said that for the financial year, that is next year, 2022 and 23, easy liquidity money supply will help attain the higher growth. And that was estimation going to the central bank. They said it will be 9.5 and 17.2 percent. You can see it, to double it is increasing. From 9.5 to 17, it is increasing the, the uh, 2023. And they said even the GDP is set to be forecasted, uh, 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 you know, at 9.5 percent for the current fiscal year. That is the prediction going by International Monetary Fund. And now we are expecting the third wave for our country, India, right? So adequate COVID-19 protocols for the third wave has to be taken if any with higher vaccination rate. Otherwise, you will not be able to even think of pitching the economy back to track. And for the financial year 2022, what is the expectation? They are saying that in the bi-monthly policy report, 5.7% you can expect the increase. But thank God, it is not more than 6. 6 is the ma minimum, sorry, maximum. That is 4% with a plus or minus band of 2%. 246 inflation targeting. So at least it is within the 6 category only. So 5, that is 5.1 is 1% uh, now. You can expect uh, for the financial year 22 to even become 5.7. So near about the maximum rate, it is higher only because situation is like this. And uh, the forecasting happens like that. And the banks are also al allowed, the commercial banks are also allowed to get funds under the MSF, Marshall Standing Facility, till September 30. That is next month. Uh, you're, till that they are able to get this fund to make sure that the money supply and the sectors, especially the priority sectors and all are not going out of, uh, you know, business or track or investment. That's why all these things. Clear? Even if you see the consumer price index for the very first time, okay, second, third and fourth quarter is projected at 5.1%, 5.9, 5.3 and 5.8. There is a row of, uh, you know, synchronization I can say in that. These are just for you to know, guys, the current affairs points. Now, taking into consideration all this, now it is very important for you to know something called as MSS. It's very interesting. What is that? It's a scheme. Market Stabilization Scheme. And that's the instrument used by whom? The Central Bank of a country, RBI. When do they use that? They use that in term, times of excess or over liquidity. Too much of money supply. Now, then the RBI will use this instrument called as Market Stabilization Scheme as such. And I can tell you it's not a new thing. Since 2004, the scheme was brought into operation by RBI. Uh, why? Because they want to surge, control the surge or increase of the US dollars Indian market. We need to control it, otherwise we'll fall in trouble. That's why we did that. And what will RBA do? Through this particular technique, RBA will, uh, you know, repair the excess money or liquidity prevailing in the market. Why? Because we have to make sure that, uh, you know, the issuance of securities on the government's behalf, like tables and security, we have to maintain that. So the excess liquidity has to be taken care of by RBA. That is why they use the uh, scheme called as market stabilization scheme. Clear? The fund that RBI is raising under the scheme, the MSS scheme, what they will do, they will create a separate account, they will keep under that, which is separate from the government account and they will not use uh, for any expenditure purpose. The RBI will not use that money for any expenditure purpose. They will keep it in a separate account and as and when the emergency comes up, they will uh, withdraw from that. Clear? But not for regular routines they will use. And a separate account is called as Market Stabilization Scheme Account. To manage the excess liquidity of money supply, the RBI will issue securities under this particular, uh, you know, bond called as market stabilization bonds again what will happen guys all the financial institutions the commercial banks and all that will start purchasing these bonds in the country and the uh, the funds earned by selling of these bonds again it will be kept back with the central bank of a country that is rbi this is how the working does practical working i'm talking about the practical working inflation targeting already i told you what is that the current affairs and all you can just go through but few important points we noted is that there is something called as strict inflation targeting 
That is when the central bank is only concerned about keeping inflation as close to our inflation target. Nothing else. That is strict inflation. Six is the maximum now. So it should be within that. Flexible is C. Sometimes it can even go more than the maximum also. Like what you saw in the COVID-19 pandemic. Kind of you kind of tend to be flexible with the targeting of inflation. That is the whole point here. Clear? The framework, the FIT framework. 4% with a plus or minus of 2%. So we follow, our country, India follow, do not follow a strict inflation. Rather, we follow flexible inflation targeting against it. And we keep the headline or the top line inflation as CPI, consumer price index. Because that is um, uh, the normal language that is reflecting the living standard of people because we end up paying price at the retail level. So that is why CPI is taken under consideration. It's clear? These are few important uh, reports, guys. Just, just for you to know. Anyways, that's done. The next important current affairs is the DSI. That is Domestic Systematically Important Insurance. That is the LIC, GIC and, uh, you know, New Insurance Company. They were considered to be Domestically Systematic Important Insurers by the IRDA. That is Insurance Regulatory Development Authority of India. Who is insurance regulator for our country, India? Okay. So just like the domestically systematic important banks like State Bank, HDFC Bank and all which is considered important, these insurance companies were considered. The companies having a better market value or let's say better branches and higher operation capacity, they only come under the category called as domestically systematic important insurers. Clear? And it refers to insurers of such huge size market uh, which is quite important from the uh, you know domestic and global level. They are coming under that particular category. So DSSIs are something, uh, a kind of category guys, they perceive as insurers which are too big or too important to fail because they have a very good branches, they perform very well. So they are coming under that so-called category. So if you see LIC, they are the largest insurer in the country. And what is the balance sheet guys? If you see they have a balance sheet of 31.2 lakh crore. What about the GIC, General Insurance Corporation as the only sole reinsurer who can reinsure in our country. And the New India Insurance Company is the largest general insurance company for our country, India. Be it LIC, GIC or New India, they are absolutely owned by the government of India. Clear? Yes, Uncle, does FRBM include this target? You mean fiscal responsibility in budget management? No, that is totally a different thing. FRBM is in the context of fiscal stability, you maintain it. It has nothing to do with this, the inflation targeting. They maintain the stability and this is indirectly connected to that. Clear? That is in the budget perspective, uh, Ankit. So what, what will they do guys when an insurance company has become a domestically systematic important insurer? They will increase the level of corporate governance. They will identify the risk and promote management culture. They will enable you to enhance the regulatory supervision and all. Clear? And there are different methods in which you will identify the DISs based on the size of operations. What is the branches they have? Uh, more than one country do, do, do they have the establishments? And uh, is there any you know, kind of substitutable insurance company there or they are unique in what they do? So all these give them the tagline. And quickly to have a, uh, you know, <clears throat> look into the IRDA, that is Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India. It has been set up under the IRDA Act of 1999. And they regulate the Indian insurance industry, I can tell you, right? Because they want to protect the interest of policy holders and uh, they want to work for the orderly growth of industry. And what is the mission? They want to protect the interest of policy holders. So they'll be able to regulate, promote and ensure orderly growth of insurance industry. Clear? You can just go through that. Then helicopter money. What is that? The unconventional, uh, you know, tool of RBI. That is when the traditional or the convection tools like R repo rate, reverse repo rate, CRR, SLR, when they failed, recently there was a notion that why don't we go for helicopter money? Because COVID-19 pandemic has completely driven off the entire economy, especially India. No money supply. So injecting money supply was the next uh, point to be considered. So here, what did they do? They said that we will print currencies. Our government asked RBI to print currencies and now that will be distributed among the public. Here, no selling of securities come up. Directly selling it off. Just like money falls from helicopter now, the same thing you can imagine here. See, the sole objective is to increase money supply. That's the concept of helicopter money. Clear? It is just to stimulate the economy during the recession or when the interest rate is falling to zero. It is also called as helicopter drop. The same thing. And it is put forward by a person called as Milton Friedman, guys. He was an American economist way back in the year 1969. And now the Telangana government in our country, India, they made a reference to this and they said, why don't we even bring this? Because it's something which we require now in this pandemic. And it requires, see, helicopter money is not just the monetary policy perspective. I can tell you, it, since it is including large sums of money to be printed and you have to distribute to the economy uh, and to the people to boost up the money supply, 
both fiscal and monetary policy has to be carried out together. The meaning of that is central bank and our government should cooperate with each other because under the after the approval of government only, I mean uh, RBI can print it. So that is why they say monetary policy and fiscal policy have to be carried out together in helicopter money. Clear? Importance is no debt, economic growth, not reversible. All these things I've thought. You can just go through that. Clear? Yes, Kriti, uh, ma'am, you taught helicopter money many times. It's now on my tips. Yeah, of course, because, you know, this is a very important topic. Who knows? The same thing in company exam also, you know. We never know. Helicopter money, quantitative easing, then, uh, <clears throat> you know, long-term repo operations. All these things I've taught. You see, the current affairs, whatever I'm revising now, what we did, the same thing only has been done here. This is just a quick revision, the marathon sessions. Clear? Now, why did SBI reduce this MCLR, guys? MCLR is a minimum interest rate the bank can lend. Right? It's an advanced version of the base rate, I can tell you. Why did SBI do that? What could be the reason? Taking into consideration the COVID-19 pandemic, they wanted to make sure that if they're not reducing, then wonderful Priya, yes, operation twist. You can connect this topic here. The same thing what I explained. If you do not do this, then our country will end up in trouble. Because the pandemic is there, money supply has to be increased. So less the interest rate, more the people can borrow the money. Otherwise, it becomes quite difficult. And there is something called as EBLR, External Benchmark Lending Rate System. Here, the interest rate will peg, be pegged to any external interest rate. And RBA is using two external benchmark, repo rate and uh, also the three-month treasury bill yield published by the FBIL, Financial Benchmark India Private Limited. In the 9.30 p.m. current affairs class, you remember I have taught you this. The same thing I have taught you. Yes, Sindhija, where are you running and going? So if you want to calculate SBI, then EBLR is equal to external benchmark rate plus credit risk premium. All these things I've taught you. Next is RBA to conduct on tap LTRO. What is LTRO, guys? See, long-term repo operations. You should know what is LTRO to know what is TLTRO. I've taught you that. Recently, RBA want to conduct a, a, you know, on tap targeted LTRO for an amount of 1 lakh crore. So they were able to ensure comfortable liquidity conditions in the system. Take care. So now, it is also a tool used by the central bank. It's an unconventional tool. Repo rate is the rate in which commercial banks will borrow from RBA for a short period. Long term repo rate is also the same thing. Here, it is not short period. Here, for a period of one year to three years, they will borrow the money at the prevailing repo rate. For, and the collateral they will accept is the government security with a matching or higher tenure, whatever it is. And targeted LTRO is the same thing. The uh, provision with, through which the banks can invest in particular or specific sector, targeted sectors. For that, they can use debt instruments. You can use your cooperative bonds, corporate bonds, your commercial papers, the non-convertible debentures. Why? Because see, be it LTRO, be it helicopter money or TLTRO, the only single notion is, or let's say quantitative easing. All these are unconventional monetary policy tools. They want to increase or push the money supply in the economy. Simple as that. Clear? And why are they called uh, uh, targeted LTR? Because central bank wants banking banks to opt for funds under this option. Specifically targeting for investment grade corporate debt. So specifically they are becoming more efficient. That's the whole point. And they can get a longer duration as compared to shorter duration loans and all guys. Which is given by RBI through repo rate and all. So LF is, uh, I mean, your LAF now compared to the repo and reverse repo rate. LTRO is pitching up because the duration is higher. So yes, my young officers, we are done. With the marathon series of money, monetary policy banking. Come on, it's a big marathon. We are finished. So how did you feel? Yes, Anke, TLTRO. Yes, of course it is 35 days. It is between one year to three years. So now we have MCQs here. We have 15 minutes more left. So in that 15 minutes, I'll do at least three or four MCQs. Okay. But the entire, entire theory based on uh, money starting from the NCRT to the comprehensive part and the current affairs of money, monetary policy, banking, RBI and also inflation. Even inflation is covered. So what else you need in solid three hours? Now it's time for MCQs. Come on, take a deep breath, relax. Do you all want the MCQs or do you all want another session or marathon for MCQs? Which one do you prefer? The choice is yours. Because I have to take a doubt clearing session also because this is a marathon class. For the very first time in YouTube, I have been doing this marathon as per your request. And I hope this is pretty much, uh, you know, encouraging for you people. 
Yes, Amanda, this is epic marathon. Kya baat hai? So if you do like this marathon, guys, I want each and everyone in this class, before leaving the class, to do two things. Like, share, subscribe, and put your comments in the comment box. This is a live chat. You After some time, you can see the comment box appearing. Not now. You can put it in that as well. Clear? So you tell me, shall we go with the MCQs now or uh, you want me to wind up? Quick, the choice is yours. But that will take another one hour, so it will be four hours. Or we will do it to the next class. We will have another marathon next week or so. Probably in the first week of September, we will have MCQs of the same topic. What do you say? Amanda is saying another session for MCQs. Kya baat hai? That's wonderful. So we can even do the MCQs in the special class also where you can poll. Poll, poll, poll you can do. That will be even more interesting. We'll do. We'll figure it out what we can do. But anyways. So, so thank you so much, Mang officers. How, that, that's indeed a brainstorming session for you as well. Because, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you got to really, really have a continuous flow. With regard to certain topics and concepts, because you never know what will come for your exam from these area. So it's better that you are all prepared and ready with such kind of topics and concepts. All these things I have been teaching you in the plus class, in the free class. Now a total combination of that in the free class. And also, before leaving the class, guys, don't forget. Don't forget to follow me via the Unacademy profile as well, because that is indeed very important. Very, very important. This is my Academy profile. You can see. So you have the free class and plus class. So tomorrow you have a plus course starting and the free class will also be there. So make sure that. So make sure that you people are following me in the free platform one Academy and using my code Nisha IAS Life. I repeat. Nisha IAS Life. Okay. That is the code you should use to get your access to the plus platform. To watch my plus classes and also so many other, educa other educators ka plus class, the batch courses at your convenient timing. Even if not live at your timing with the quality test, the uh, mentoring program. So this is not just a discount for you. Rather it is, uh, you know, getting you into the personal mentoring program of mine also. Come and learn the live classes to become IAS officers with me. And that is Nisha IAS life. So don't forget. Come on, that is indeed, indeed a big marathon. <clears throat> Almost my voice is gone, I should say. But energy is still there anyways. Yes, Pradosh. Yeah, 10 hours we covered in 3 hours. That's that's the benefit of us. So solid, uh, you know, 7 hours we saved. Don't you think so? This is the way you got to prepare as a UPSC candidate. Because this is called a smart work method. The 3C approach, the 3R approach and the 3D approach. Concept, comprehensive part, trending current affairs, interlinkaging and the 3R. Read, revise, repeat and the 3Ds. Det uh, determination, dedication, discipline. This is what you should follow. That is what I have followed in this marathon. So obviously you got to follow the same thing, right? Chalo. Yes, Amanda, I really need. So thank you so much. I hope you really enjoyed this marathon. I'll see you all soon with another set of marathon like this in the Unacademy platform and also in this YouTube channel. So don't forget to keep attending all these sessions and also very importantly guys, as I told you, subscribe, like and comment. Clear? And tomorrow again, 9.30, we'll be back to the current affairs. 9.30 p.m. We will have the regular economic current affairs series happening. Part 21 will be discussed tomorrow. Another set of hit list economic current affairs. Fata -fat -fat like that. In a short, quick and to the point manner, we'll be discussing. Do come for that 30 minutes class tomorrow as always at 9.30. Clear? Any doubts, any queries that you want to say, do let me know. That's it. Perfect. So yes, go have a great sleep because it's a marathon CD we had. Relax, get back uh, tomorrow morning to your books. Revise what I've taught you because... The three are what I've taught you. Read, revise, repeat is very, very important. Indeed, it is the most important thing. Clear? So, yes. Thank you. Good night, Shibratri and Jayant. And see you all at 9.30 p.m. tomorrow for this YouTube live class of Economic Current Affairs and in the Unacademy Plus platform. 
from morning 9 to 11 and uh, you know 12 to 2 for the MCQ series and also the free special life classes. So to be a part of plus class, once again, Nisha IA's live is a code. Use it and do join them. Bag all the offers in an academy. Make sure that you are on the right track. Either GS or options or both together, you can go for it. So thank you and take it, my young officers.